destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. <laughs> And I get the feeling you've been cheated. It's Tuesday, October 22nd, 2019. I'm Michael Brooks on a Sam Michael Hybrid Tuesday. We're broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On today's program, Pamela Newkirk on Diversity Inc. Interview Sam just recorded hot off of the presses. India and Pakistan trade fire in Kashmir, killing nine in one of the most contentious areas in the globe, even as the Indian military occupation of Kashmir continues months after the Modi government scrapped the Indian constitution to strip autonomy for Kashmir. Not to worry, there's a great new photo op with the Prime Minister, along with Henry Kissinger, Condoleezza Rice, and Tony Blair. I'm sure that they are centering humanity in those talks. Oh, and by the way, the Indian economy is collapsing. U.S. diplomat Bill Taylor, drawn into Trump's Ukraine efforts, set to testify on Tuesday. Support for impeaching and removing Donald Trump is at an all-time high, according to a CNN poll. Fake news. Fake news. It's the fake news, folks. Ain't nothing fake about what the hell is going on with Donald Trump's face, as you'll see. Iran says U.S. forces withdrawing from Syria have no approval to stay. Workers at Chile's in a Chilean copper mine, the world's largest, are set to walk off the job today. Canadian elections, Trudeau hangs on to power. Just one shade of makeup on. As the NDP performs pretty well, there's going to be some type of coalition government. The MAGA Chud. Dave Rubin guest, uh, Bernier, not only did not lead a new fascist party in Canada, he lost his own seat. Netanyahu cannot form a government. Israel might be headed to another set of elections. There is no difference from the perspective of Palestinian humanity on the ballot. Trump has discovered what the Emoluments Clause is, and it's phony. It's phony, folks. All that, plus the movement continues in Haiti against occupying forces, the World Bank, IMF, and the corrupt political class. And a new book wax Kamala Harris's AG record during the housing crisis. Important history, but maybe not as important a candidate as people might have thought. You know, when she said, I'm a top-tier candidate, that was like bad karma. Yeah, she honestly, she seemed like someone who would I do thought well she would. in the Democratic Party of totally. today. I, I, I was. Uh, I think that's my biggest uh, miscall of the election. I totally thought Kamala Harris was going to be solid. Um, Donald Trump is in a bad mood. He had to reverse himself from hosting the G seven at one of his own hotels. <laughs> and as Mick Mulvaney said, I mean, he still really thinks of himself as being in the hospitality business. I mean. What's more hospitality than being president in the United States? Uh, this clip is great. One, I just want to do, and I'm loath to do this, as everybody knows. I'm not into this stuff, but I do want to give a trigger warning. His face is horrifying. I'm not going to do like a fake woke thing about people's bodies, whatever is going on here, whatever bleach he's using and how that's counteracting with the thing on his head is it's a tough deal. Well, so, Oompa Loompas are a historically marginalized group, so you might want to be a bit sensitive. I mean, I, fair enough. If he comes out and owns his identity as whatever that is, I will try to be more sensitive. As of now, this is just a really terrifying tanning job, which cannot be adding to a already... I mean, this is not... 
there's Trump when he's funny. There's Trump when he's dunking on Jeb. There's Trump when he's talking about, you know, Democratic candidates and he's loose. Uh, this is, I just had to cancel the hotel. Bitchy Trump. Very bitchy Trump. And when Trump is bitchy, there's one person that comes to mind. <laughs> they ran their business. Hey, Obama made a deal for a book. Is that running a business? Uh, I, I'm sure he didn't even discuss it while he was president. Uh, yeah. uh, he has a deal with Netflix. When did they start talking about that? That's only, you know, a couple of examples. But other presidents, if you look, other presidents were wealthy. Not huge wealth. George Washington was actually considered a very, very rich man at the time. But they ran their businesses. George Washington, they say, had two desks. He had a presidential desk and a business desk. I don't think uh, you people with this phony emoluments clause. And by the way, so uh, I would say that it's cost me anywhere from two to five billion dollars to be president. So that's okay between uh, what I lose and what I could have made. Oh, my God. Okay, definitely being president is absolutely the first solid look. Donald Trump as a businessman is a failure. Donald Trump as an entertainer is pretty successful. And being president is by far, I, I think that is originally why he ran for president, was probably because this is a way to actually reach oligarch status, not just like in my vision board would be my guess. So that's great. Now, you know, look. Do presidents leave office and do they even know that something in the future is going to influence their decisions today, even if it's not as naked and obvious as Trump? Yeah, probably. And this is like the classic Trump pattern where he's sort of like in his own narcissistic, self-victimizing, whiny way makes like a third of a point. But the fact check is really funny. And I also do like the idea that like, What's the difference between getting a book agent after your president and booking people to stay at your hotels? It's all the same thing. George Washington, they say chop down the cherry tree. Say chop down the cherry tree. He owns slaves. That's a significant business. I love the projection like Obama had Reed Hastings in the White House. Like, nudge, nudge, Reed. <laughs> yeah. You know what's going to happen when so I'm not Had here, right? Reed over, did a great deal. Great business guy. Netflix is a great business. But People don't want me to make deals. We're supposed to be incredibly cynical about Obama, but all these instances with Trump and all this, all his emoluments issues were supposed to act like... No, it's just like... I didn't... Yeah. Is that Asking the Saudi royal family if they want to stay at my hotels before a major arms deal is the most innocent, commonsensical thing in the world. <laughs> Barack Obama getting a book deal is sinister. And like, how much understand. money does he make off of any of these stays? Like, it seems like a little petty. I don't even know. I just know that I'm in the hospitality business. I had, I had one desk for business, one desk for work. A monuments clause. Ridiculous. Fake news. Many thousands, Jamie. Fake news. Sat down with Netflix. They're a great company. I'm a great president. We do great business. Did deals. <laughs> they should just give him a really good reality show and tell him that, you know, being president is going to be more like you want it to be now. And then, you know, we can have another place where the real president is. If they if he loses, they should pretend that he wins and get him into the simulation. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. As, OK, yeah, yeah. So he thinks. No, but I'm saying he needs to think that. Yeah, like yeah. The whole time. Yeah. Like we need to won, get him into the you like, won. You won. And, and now, now all of a sudden you have a 95 percent approval rating. And all of the best entertainers want to come this time. And it's a reality show. And that part will be real because it'll be hilarious. Oh, yeah. We'll definitely watch that. It'll be like the Truman Show. I'm totally into that concept. Because I, look, I still want Trump to have a highly active Twitter account until he's <laughs> until he dies. Big time. <laughs> Big league. I just want to say, I just, apropos of nothing, uh, this is a Trump quote from 2013 and this is a good example of why i still want him on twitter and by and why what kamala harris is saying this is just a not only a problematic politically it's just a huge assault on entertainment this is donald trump from 2013 new york fashion week is really bad it used to be so glamorous and exciting no stars no fun just boring they need serious help. Hashtag New York Fashion Week. 
Sorry. I'm sure he misses the big hair and shoulder pads. Of course he does. Um, you could just walk into the dressing room. <laughs> you could just, oh, Jesus. Humans have been shaving for thousands of years, but the secret to a great shave hasn't, sha hasn't changed much. That's why Harry's doesn't overcharge you to add gimmicky features to their razors. Harry's is a return to the essential. Quality, durable blades at a fair price. Just two per blade. Just $2 per blade. They've cut out the middleman by manufacturing blades in their German blade factory, which has been honing precision blades for a century. That means you get incredibly high quality bl blades at factory direct prices. There's no risk trying them out. If you, love, if, if you don't love your shave, you let them know and they'll get you a full refund. Listeners of our show now can redeem their Harry's trial set at harrys.com slash majority report. You'll get a weighted ergonomic handle for a firm grip, a five blade razor with lubricating, blaze, uh, lubricating strip and trimmer blade. A, long, a rich lathering shave gel with aloe to keep your skin hydrated and a travel blade cover to keep your razor, razor dry and easy to grab on the go. Go to harrys.com slash majority report to start shaving better today. Would you rather be busy or productive, Matt Luck? Uh, productive, obviously. Start making... Start making your work take less work and find the right software for you at captera.com slash majority. Captera is the leading free online resource to help you find the best software solution for your business. With over 1 million reviews of products from software users, discover everything you need to make an informed decision. Search more than 700 specific categories of software. Everything from project management to email marketing to yoga studio management software. No matter what kind of software your business needs, Captera makes it easy to discover the right solution fast. Join the millions of people who use Captera each month to find the right tools for their business. Now, Sam, I can tell you, I need, I'm actually starting to get on Captera for my business, and I've been reading the reviews. And like Sam, I have to admit, I have been reading about all sorts of businesses that I have nothing to do with because it is actually kind of fascinating to understand, like, how does somebody run a yoga studio, as an example? It's actually really interesting. Actually, some of the software we use to run this show is uh, listed on Captera. That's right. And this show has been significantly more efficient, as efficient as this group of humans can be because of Captera solutions. Visit captera.com slash majority for free today to find the tools to make an informed software decision for your business. Captera.com slash majority. That's C-A-P-T-E-R-R-A dot com slash majority. Captera. Software selection simplified. All right, folks, we're going to take a brief break, and then we're going to be right back with Sam's conversation with Pamela Newkirk, Diversity, Inc. On the phone, it's a pleasure to welcome to the program professor of journalism at New York University, author of her latest, The Failed Promise of a Billion Dollar Business, Diversity, Inc. Pamela Newkirk, welcome to the program. Thank you so much, Sam. Uh, let's, I mean, let's first start, I guess, with um, the, uh, the, w what that billion dollar business is uh, before we get on to the, the failed prom, both the, the promise and the <laughs> failure, I guess. Um, right. Because I don't, I'm not sure that um, people are totally savvy as to the, the existence of diversity as an industry. Right. And, and it's kind of a different way of thinking of it. But um, so I guess I'll start at the beginning. When I uh, was thinking about this project, what, what brought me to it was just constantly reading these reports um, by companies like Google. Uh, like every year they would look at their diversity numbers and issue a report and Every year they would talk about the disappointing results. And then uh, I also kept reading about these uh, 
institutional scandals, if you will, where, um, you know, there was some revelation either about um, a racial episode in the workplace that then, you know, would cause the the company, the institution, the higher diversities are. And then, you know, I just started reading about all of the money that is spent on diversity by various institutions every year. Um, I, I, the, the task forces that are assembled and the climate surveys that are commissioned and the diversity consultants that are hired and the diversity czars and the diversity conferences that draw hundreds of people uh, to, you know, to cities around the country and then started thinking of it as an industry. And we're looking at an industry that is actually growing um, by leaps and bounds, uh, particularly over the past couple of years with um, the rise in movements like uh, Me Too and Black Lives Matter. The diversity uh, uh, jobs are on the rise. Um, and it, the, uh, there was a study um, by Indeed.com uh, that that showed that the numbers had gone up something like 35% over the over the last couple of years. Um, you know the postings for diversity jobs. So we're we're talking about an industry. Uh, a professor at MIT uh, more than 10 years ago had said at that time companies were spending something like uh, eight billion dollars a year on diversity, and since that time the numbers have gone up. So we're talking about a a, a burgeoning industry. And it, it, I mean, the uh, maybe I'm jumping ahead just a little bit, but I mean, from your mm-hmm. perspective, and, and and we should say that you know one of the books you wrote uh, within the veil, black journalists, white media, sort of, mm-hmm. I guess, um, you know, uh, extrapolated on on the problem uh, on some mm-hmm. level, um, right, right. The, how we're not really making the progress that one would think we would have made over fifty years of looking at this issue and, and yeah. grappling with this issue. And I, and I want to get to that because that's the, uh, that's the failed promise, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. But does the, to the extent, I mean, is there a way to maybe even make this assessment, but when we see the reaction of, you know, the, the sort of the apparatus, right, to increase mm-hmm. diversity, how sincere you know, and we could talk about the efficacy of this apparatus and, and, and why it, it has not been effective. But how sincere mm-hmm. is the effort, do you think? I mean, because we do see it in reaction to like, oh, we had employees who removed, um, you know, uh, two uh, black people from our store because uh, and now we've got to we're going to have all this <laughs> right. training. Like how how right. sincere? we're going to have this big like public kind of uh right how much of it is public relations and well, and how much well, of it is a a sense i mean how much of it is what, what to what extent can you attribute w- what motives to it i guess right well well only only the institutional leaders can can honestly say how sincere they are i i can only look at the results of their efforts um that they're spending billions of dollars on something and getting and having very little to show for it and doing the same thing over and over that it, that is not bearing results so i'm just wondering why I, you know, when you keep doing the same thing and getting the same results, then maybe you need to try something new, right? Um, so, you know, that's that's in part what inspired me to look at this because it's like we're having the same conversations for decades, the exact same conversations, you know, looking at these numbers where black law partners um, increased from one point. Seven percent to one point eight percent between 1985 and 2016. Looking at um, uh, black men in management um, at companies with 100 and more employees, going from three percent to 3.2 percent over years. Um, you know, the the, the largest uh, public fashion and apparel companies, where only 11 percent of board seats are held by people of color, who who comprise roughly 40 percent of the population. So 
if if all of these companies are spending, you know, some hundreds of millions and you know, you know, collectively billions of dollars a year, a year, and having so little to show for it, like what could we do differently? What what um, like what new ways might we look at at a systemic problem? Um, because surely what's happening now is not working. All right. And before we get to sort of like that, that concept of, of solution, and, and I think, you know, you give uh, obviously um, the statistics that you just laid out for us are indicative, uh, you know, across uh, any number of industries in, 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 right. in, a, in a myriad of different ways. Uh, you, mm-hmm. you talk about the entertainment industry uh, as well in that regard. Um, like, I guess... Um, the 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 relevance of the question. I mean, obviously, you can't um, you can't assess intent, but right. are there indications? And I'm not, I, I'm not, I don't have a. I, I'm, I, it sounds like the, this is an agenda driven question, but it's not. Right. <laughs> um, but I'm just curious to what extent, like, is mission accomplished simply by showing the expenditure? Like, well. Yeah, um, I, I I think that's the approach that many of these institutions are taking. That to um, to simply construct an apparatus of diversity is indication of n- enough that that institution cares about diversity. And I, I'm not certain that many institutional leaders are owning their role in the in the result. Part of it, like you know, they're kind of farming it out to a consultant or to um, some marginalized division within the institution, instead of actually saying that you know this is something that I, as a leader, need to incentivize. Um, you know, when leaders of companies actually care about something, <laughs> right. they can they can they can move the needle um, if they don't farm it out and actually say the buck stops with me. Uh, you could see this this problem pretty much. Um, you could see progress pretty much overnight in many institutions if that kind of intention is is brought to bear. So I, I think um, you know when you ask me how sincere they are. I mean, they may think they're sincere. They may be sincere, but. If this was another kind of problem that affected their bottom line and they were failing consistently, I I would just imagine that, you know, if you're a CEO of a company and things are failing and you're throwing a lot of money at it, you're going to want to try something different. And so I I think with this problem, I think there needs to be some serious soul searching to – find out why we're doing the same thing if it's not working. Right. I mean, if we if if the agenda was in a company we need to increase our sales uh, in 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 this uh, region of the world and uh, right. you know, five three years later and look at it and like it hasn't moved a needle, I would say right. we, we need to do something different. I mean, that's right. what I guess and, and- I, I mean, so yes, and and if every year you're it, like every year you're releasing reports that saying, "Oh, we're disappointed," like <laughs> you're going to be d- disappointed for decades. <laughs> like, at, at what point do you take responsibility for for that failure? Um, who who does that failure belong to? Like, who who gets to own that failure? And I I think the way it's been looked at is you can blame a consultant or you can blame you know the diversities are you can blame it's it's, it's out there, you know. The finger is pointing outward when it really should, you know, go in the other direction. It, well, it, it's a it's a systemic problem, and it's a leadership issue in in, in a lot in a lot of um, these situations. Well, if it is, I mean, let's look at it from the perspective of of the systemic qualities of it. I mean, because I think um, it, I mean, you know, the the idea that there isn't a reevaluation of the methodology suggests right. to me that there isn't necessarily a feeling of genuine failure, that the attempt is sufficient for a lot of right. the people who are, right. who are doing this to fulfill what is the actual problem, which is the perception yeah, I, that they're right. And I, 
Right. And I think perception has a lot to do with this, too. I think many people have still um, clung to this mythology that, you know, people of color are not in these positions because there are not enough qualified people of color or there are, you know, um, the, the, the problem is the pipeline. Um, that's a that's that's a, 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 a critique that you heard a lot in the 1960s when diversity became, uh, you know, sort of like a public you know, a social concern, you know, from the president on down. This is something that we need to to address. Um, there was an acknowledgement that that African Americans and other people of color had been systemically shut out of most fields. But in that time, in in the fifty years that ha- that have uh, you know since then, um, it, it's no longer possible to to point solely to a pipeline issue when you've had scores of people of color going through not only just college, but some of the most elite schools in this country. And yet we still have this problem where we're saying, you know, we tried and, you know, we just kind of throw up our hands and it's like, no, let's, let's do a little bit more than that. Let's, let's really look. So something that Coca-Cola did after it, it was sued for discrimination and, and it settled, um, what it did is it looked at the metrics across the company. It looked at hiring, promotions, bonuses, who was getting, who was not, by racial group, by gender, and then they were able to both identify patterns of bias and to disrupt those patterns of bias in real time. So they would look at these metrics even before a job offer was made, even before, um, you know, bonuses or, 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 or you know, raises were, were given to see are there patterns of bias. You know, a lot of this is not intentional bias, right. but... You know, we we live in a, a racialized society where where you know ideas are deeply embedded and they they play out in 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 ways that are kind of insidious. We don't often see it. It's sort of an invisible thing. But if you look at the metrics in this way, then maybe you can like make some adjustments. So this is just one way that a company kind of turned itself around um, well, and, you, and, and became a lot more racially diverse. Can you give us a, a, like a like a like even a more a sort of like granular examples in that way? So in other words, um, you would look in the uh, I don't know the I don't know the different divisions of, of Coca-Cola, but you would look in distribution and right, so uh, you'd look at people in the same job and see, okay, like what are the salaries across that 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 job category? What um, um, if you if you're hiring, what what does the applicant pool look like? What does the who's getting bonuses? So if you look at that across the board and you kind of like you know do that kind of assessment, uh, it, it, you can actually see. <laughs> Patterns, and um, so that's how they did it. Um, and then they would say to the it. human resources uh, in those uh, different divisions, "Look, you are um, yeah. What's your going rate on here? of hiring is is uh, much lower based upon right. the applicant pool you have, or right. another division. Right. Your bonuses right. are are, are uh, you know, and and making people conscious of that." Uh, of disparities, right? Making people a lot more conscious of these patterns of disparity. Uh, yeah, so that that's one way. And I mean, obviously, that took that took intention. It took um, you know vigilance. Um, but that's that's what they did, and that's how they turned Coca Cola around. Um, so there are models that are, that exist. Um, you know, but if you look in higher education, where African Americans are about four percent of university professors, and Latinos are three percent or under. Um, like in a country where those two groups alone are about thirty percent of the population, you know, something needs to like there should be some way to look at what's going on, what's going on with who's not only who's hired, who's even considered uh, for for these positions. To what extent? I mean, it, it, I mean, is there a um, is there a, a a pipeline problem or a uh, maybe 
I mean, a culture, there's obviously a cultural problem insofar as you have these disparities in the way that maybe people perceive. But, I, you know, a while back we interviewed, uh, maybe I guess it was over the summer, uh, Anthony Abraham Jack, who, who uh, wrote a book, uh, I think it was called The uh, Privileged Poor, uh, about um, how elite colleges are failing disadvantaged students, um, where it, you know, uh, one of the things he looked at was uh, particularly um, um, African American uh, students who were, you know, coming from uh, from uh, living, you know, in poverty or uh, uh, down further on the income distribution, and that colleges would seek out uh, African American students. Um, they were more apt to admit them if they had already been accultured in a private school uh, mm -hmm. in some way. And I, right. I, I wonder to... to well, they, they, because, uh, you know, I, I guess that their defense is that they want students who can compete with, <laughs> with, with their peers, and they, 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 they don't want to set students up to fail. But I guess what, what, what I want to say about this is that, um, you know, I think you're talking about the pipeline. And uh, as I said, for five decades, we've talked about the pipeline. For many of these fields, that's no longer the issue. Um, because what I found is that the more elite, the smaller, the more boutique a field is, the less diverse it is. So we're talking about oftentimes like newsrooms where we're not talking about large numbers of people. Right. We're talking about, like, if you only look at, took one elite journalism school and, and just considered candidates from that one elite journalism school, you could, you could turn around newsrooms <laughs> like pretty much overnight um, with diversity. So I think, you know, I, the, the higher up you go, the more elite um, the field or, or uh, you know, museums. Um, we're not talking about needing, you know, thousands of people. I, it, I think it's why companies like Coca-Cola, um, you know, corporate America is far more diverse than some of the more uh, elite progressive fields. You know, we look at journalism, we look at, um, uh, you know, all the other higher ed. It, it, it doesn't take that many people to move the needle on this, on this, but yet we're not really moving the needle. Okay, so if I understand what you're saying, you know, that, that you're talking about, um, you know, Coca-Cola hires um, uh, thousands of people. Exactly. Where, whereas, you know, thousands of people may uh, include everybody who works in broadcast media in New York City. Um, right. And that the to, in terms of getting percentages, um, much easier to find candidates, uh, you know, enough, uh, theoretically, but, but so right. let me ask you this, is it, is it, um, is it, and I guess what I was getting at with, with, with bringing up, um, that, that other, uh, research was that is the issue that there are sort of like, I guess th there are cultural streams or something like that, that people don't recognize and don't break out of. Um, that, um, you know, uh, that, that there is other factors at work or they just, I mean, well, there, there are definitely social networks. And right. I think a lot of this is due to social networks. I mean, I live in New York city, uh, have, have, you know, I'm born and raised here and I often attend events uh, related to publishing or journalism or the arts. And oftentimes, um, I, I'm one of few people of color in the room. Um, it, these are fields that in which people of, of color are acutely underrepresented. And I think these kind of segregated social spheres are then replicated in the workplace because who do we hire? We hire who we know, who we're friends with, who our friends recommend. And I think, you know, we do live in a society in which we are pretty much socially segregated. Uh, and, and, and I think that then plays out in other ways. So I'm not talking about overt racism. I'm right. just talking right. about the natural ebb and flow of <laughs> of our relations and, and what happens due to those relations. So who gets recommended for 
a, a faculty position? Who gets recommended for a, a great, you know, position at a radio station or a TV station or a newspaper? Oftentimes, it's not people who who are not reflected in these very um, small social spheres. So I, I think and, that's and, that's and we a should natural say, part of this. Yeah, those things are downstream from right. more uh, racist practices, right? Precisely. This has nothing to do. This is not racism. This is just the way we live in, in a society that has kind of been um, socially ordered this way. We, we live in, in a very, you know, we like to think of ourselves as living in a, in a progressive, integrated society, but, you know, our churches are pretty much segregated. Our schools are pretty much segregated. Our, our you know, Where we living live. arrangements. Right. Our, yes. Yeah. So, I mean, so this is all part and parcel of, of, you know, how we find these workplaces and, and particularly the more elite ones um, are, are, are still very, very uh, segregated. And, and, and theoretically, a lot of these elite ones, too, probably have um, a, a more bearing, and certainly when you talk about journalism, when we talk about entertainment on some level, more bearing right. on uh, uh, the culture in some ways, you know. Precisely. It, it, okay, so how much of the the argument of, you know, who our market is? I mean, for instance, I can tell you that I used to, um, uh, years and years ago, I was a sitcom actor, and uh, I did a, a sitcom where I played the uh, white uh, writer on an all-black variety show. It was a very <laughs> early job I had. Uh, it was on Fox TV. I'm not doing an advertisement for myself. It's long gone. Um, but but I, it, was, it was really my first or second job in Hollywood, and um, I, it didn't occur to me until the, the, the decade that followed how rare it was that I was on a show where I was the only white guy, maybe there was one other white guy on the show and everyone right. else was black because, right. uh, and the difficulty of a show like that because of it, you know, or I should say, you know, the audience, the, the cell to the audience is very segregated. It's, it's either got to be a black show but, or a white but I show. Think, but, but I think that's a really old fashioned way of looking at the world as it is today. Well, I got to um, say, all, to be all, fair, no, that was 25 years ago, but that, yes. All of the research shows that more diverse casts are, are make more money. <laughs> uh, films with uh, diversity make more money than films that don't have it. Um, so I think that is the way that, that that's a very old Hollywood way of looking at it, that you do a black cast for a black audience and a white cast for a white audience. Shonda Rhimes kind of like just exploded that whole myth mm. um, by having diverse casts that were are, are among the most popular shows on television. Um, and we're seeing the same thing with film. Um, uh, the Hollywood Diversity Report, there are a number of reports that come out every year by uh, USC and UCLA that show that diversity sells, and, and it particularly in a global market that is, that is more, um, you know, likely to, to gravitate to films that, that reflect the world. So, yeah, I think there was a time when... That is the way that that's what producers, directors, um, you know, people who greenlight projects thought of audiences. But that is not actually how audience audiences work. Look at some of the, the, the biggest films uh, of the past couple of years. Uh, Black Panther, uh, Crazy right. Rich Asians. Um, you know, I can go on and on. Well, I think don't it's, fall I think... into that predictable, like, blacks for blacks and whites for whites. I mean, well, I think the consumer I think facing we're more aspect. No, I, I mean, uh -huh. I, and I agree. And, I, and, and this show was, you know, in the uh, uh, mid 90s. And, and I think um, the, the consumer facing part of it now, I think, right. is, uh, has changed. Um, mm -hmm. Yet, you still have a problem with the with the producers in terms of right. like a lack of diversity. You still have a problem with the writers in in terms of a lack of diversity. Um, the people who aren't facing, you know, sort of consumer facing on some level. And um, I, I, 
So, and I guess my point was more just sort of the consciousness of the different networks that existed. Like I would, I never right, saw right. any of those, uh, those, those men and women that I was on that show with. I never saw them again. Like, they, you know, at auditions. To the point about our separate social yes. spheres. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm sure that's true. I mean, I, I can't tell you how many weddings or parties I've gone to of my white friends when I'm it. So <laughs> like, how, so, okay. And so, so I understand you can, uh, you know, if you're, if you're, if you're a company the size of Coca-Cola, you can make right. these changes because you can actually, you have a lot of data. Um, exactly. If you're talking about a small, um, you know, uh, like a like a small journalism shop, or you're talking about, you know, even like a broadcast news, and you don't have that many people there, the data is not as sort of like obvious, right? Where because like one person could change the percentage by you know a significant amount. Um, how do you do it in that? Like, wh what is? Wh are there? Do you well, have examples I, in that I, situation where? I, yeah, I guess diversity just has to matter to a company. Matter not just, um, you know, for the bottom line, but matter as just an issue of justice and what's right. Um, do we not hire people because they're of color? Does having diversity make us smarter, give us, give us, a, you know, just a, a, a broader take on the society that, that we're covering? I mean, can you really cover a diverse society with all white newsrooms or can you do it fairly? Can, can you do, you know, can you do it well? Um, so, so I think when we think of diversity as more than just uh, check a box, um, but as something that actually makes us better, um, then I think that might give uh, news directors, managers, more of an incentive to do it because it just will make for a better product. But what if um, they don't? How you how you do it is it, it's it's really not that hard. I, I know at NYU when, um, you know, when we have searches, because we have a, a far more diverse faculty now than when I joined the faculty 25 years ago, we have a much broader social network and, and professional network that, you know, that we have our tentacles out right. in the world in, in, a, in a, you know, a far more <laughs> comprehensive way. It becomes so self-replicating on some level. Precisely. But and and do if you, you don't have that and it's not self-replicating, it's not that hard, especially in journalism. I mean, we're journalists. <laughs> we, right. we do research. Um, how, how do we find people who don't look like us? Well, what if there, there is not that? organizations. There are, you know, there are all kinds of ways to do it. It's really not. I, I think we treat diversity as like rocket science like to to do it is like so hard it really isn't well it then really isn't what if the answer is that there's a lot of these places that don't consider it important and that uh, well, they don't consider it that, important beyond the sort of the public relations aspect of it which well, they feel is satisfied by expending money and saying we're doing our best well then then we'll continue to have the consistently uh, disappointing reports and and we'll just like accept that i guess i guess i'm calling it out <laughs> because because i mean come on right. it's it's like 50 years of saying the same thing it's it's just it doesn't go down well such as the failed promise of a billion dollar business diversity inc uh, pamela newkirk thank you so much for your time today i really appreciate it thank you sam Thank you, Sam. Okay, folks, we're going to go to the fun half. Become a member of the Majority Report today, majority.fm slash become a member. Today's show was brought to you in part by Captara. Captara is the leading free online resource to help you find the best software solution for your business. With over 1 million reviews of products from software users, from real software users, discover everything you need to make an informed decision. Go to capterra.com slash majority for free to find tools to make an informed software decision for your business. capterra.com slash majority. Capterra, that's C-A-P-T-E-R-R-A dot com slash majority. Capterra, software selection simplified. 
Tonight on the Michael Brooks Show, we're going to be talking with John Iarola and Artesia Balthrop, um, talking about Extinction Rebellion and how not to mobilize people for a global environmental movement. We're talking about Lebanon, Chile, the Bernie rally, and much, much more this past Sunday in illicit history of how to build a global labor movement with Chuka Ajekman, which was really fascinating. Chuka what? Chuka Ajekum. Chuka Ajekum. We're, uh, so huge amount of content. I'll just say tonight I'm recording it, an interview with Adolf Reed, um, and then another uh, interview that will be coming out uh, with another very well-known person pretty soon as well, um, as well as uh, not confirmed yet, but we will be talking with the great Nina Turner on TMBS. Have the best people. Yeah, uh, the best people. Patreon.com slash TMBS, Michael Brooks Show on YouTube. And tomorrow we're a month out from our Philly show, of which we are well over. We're, I think we're actually like two-thirds sold out of it. So I would get your tickets if you want to come see us in Philly. World Cafe, Crystal Ball, Artesia Balthrop, Emma Viglin. Super stoked. See you there. Jamie. So this week on the Antifada, we had on not one, but two guests. Uh, we had Sham Khanna, the editor of Commune Mag, and Josh Strawn, who is in a band called Azer Swan, and he's also a thoughtful and political guy. So we previewed a bit of what's in the new issue of Commune. It sounds pretty cool. Um, we talked about the Bernie rally that me, Andy, and Sean all, uh, me, sorry, me, Andy, and Sham all went to. And then we talked a little bit about music. It's been a while since we've done a music episode and we like music and it's the month for spooky music. I mean, that's every month for me, but you know, everyone enjoys spooky music in October. So we talked about some current music that we like and uh, yeah, we did something a little different than our usual format. And um, it was kind of a tie in because Josh's band will be playing at my benefit show that I'm throwing for El Comedor which is a mutual aid kitchen in Tijuana, run along autonomous principles. And that's going to be Friday at Transpicos, um, kind of on the border between Brooklyn and Queens. And I've got Azer Swan and other bands that you guys probably haven't heard of, but are really awesome. It's going to be super goth and freaky and weird and fun and raise money for a good cause. So I hope someone can, some of you can come. Rad. Links on the website, I'm assuming. Okay. Yeah. Matt. Uh, yeah, coming up uh, this weekend on Literary Hangover, I'm going to be talking about the Salem Witch Trials. This is going to be a spooky episode. Uh, talking about it as uh, a sort of violent transition from a theocratic to a secular age, and also as a cover-up of the Mather family, who spent the 1680s writing about how witches are real and you should take them seriously, and then uh, well, come that's to true. find 1692 uh, that people Many were getting people hung from. thought it was a cover-up for the Mather family. Look, I find these witches, folks. Yeah, and, the, <laughs> and then the Mathers were like, actually, we didn't, we, uh, we would... We would have been more cautious, but anyway. Fake news, fake news. Like, so, you mean like so like it was? They were like they were like the early Trumps. They were just like, she has sunburn. She should be burned. Ten years later, I never said that. I never started anything with the witches. Yeah, sort of like that. I'll have okay. to think about how Trump maps onto the witch trials. Yeah, so. please. I mean, come on. If you can't yeah. think of a Trump angle, then gotta have I a hook. can't filter it into modern parlance. God, that's depressing. All right, folks. We'll see you on the fun half. Left is best. Jamie and I may have a disagreement. Yeah, you can't just say whatever you want about people just because you're rich. I have an absolute right to mock them on YouTube. He's up there buggy whipping like he's the boss. I am not your employer. You know, I'm tired of the negativity. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to upset you. You're nervous, you're a little bit uh, upset, you're riled up. Yeah, maybe you should rethink your defense of that, you fucking idiots. We're just going to get rid of you. All right. But dude. 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 Uh, you want to smoke this joint? Yes. Do you feel like you are a dinosaur? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good shit. Exactly. I'm happy now. It's a win-win. It's a win-win-win. Oh, uh, hell yeah. Now listen to me. Two, three, four, five times. Eight, four, seven, nine, oh, six, five, oh, one, four, five, seven. 
32, 38, 56, 27, one half, five eighths, 3.9 billion. Wow. He's the ultimate math nerd, don't you see? Why don't you get a real job instead of spewing vitriol and hatred, you left wing Limbaugh? Everybody's taking their dumb juice today. Come on, Sammy. Dance, dance, dance. My first post-coital scene with uh, a woman. I'm hoping to add more moves to my repertoire. All I have is the dip and the swirl. Fine, we can double dip. Yes, this is a perfect moment. No. Wait, what? You make under a million dollars a year. You're scum. You're nothing. Excuse me? Fuck you, you fucking liberal elite. I think you belong in jail. Thank you for saying that, Sam. You're a horrible, despicable person. All right, going to take a quick break. I want to take a moment to talk to some of the libertarians out there. Take whatever vehicle you want to drive to the library. What you're talking about is jibber jabber. Classic. I'm feeling more chill already. Donald Trump can kiss all of our asses. Hey, Sam. Hey, Andy. You guys ready to uh, do some evil? Hitler was such an idiot. I think I might be a Nazi. Agreed. No. Death to America. You. Yes. Wow. Wow, that's weird. No way! Unbelievable. This guy's got a really good hook. Throw our hands up. <laughs> uh, wow. Uh, um, but Sam, I gotta get off. No worries. Ooh. Let's let's I wanna just flesh this out a little bit. I mean, look, it's a free speech issue. If you don't like me, hey, 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 hey. shut up! Thank you for calling into the majority report. Sam will be with you shortly. Welcome to the fun half, ladies and gents. I still gotta call into the uh phone system, but let's uh Let's play some uh, sound, shall we? It's a message for you. I did almost have a Sam moment right there. Where is my sound sheet? Oh, it's there. Uh, what? Shit! Shit! Shit. My sound sheet! God damn! Should we do the guy talking Brandy, about how fifty you... million is? Oh, my sound sheet's here. Yes, we can do that. Um. So there's a couple of different interesting things in this Fox News clip. Uh, Bernie Sanders has, beginning in 1997, proposed a wealth tax uh, to shore up some basic decency in this society. Um, He's proposing a very aggressive one in this campaign. Elizabeth Warren has put a modest wealth tax on the uh, forward as well. And uh, of course, shockingly, these are, in the normal world, extremely popular proposals amongst normal terrestrial human beings. There's a couple ways to respond to this. And I, especially after watching this clip, I would not be terribly surprised if Donald Trump pretends to support some form of wealth tax in the general election. I, I think he still needs some fake populist moves. And obviously, you know, he's a fundamentally dishonest person and a relentless liar. So, you know, he can shift his rhetoric and shift his emphasis. and He might go for a wealth tax. Oh, yeah, because um, the trade stuff is done. That ship has sailed. The trade stuff, I mean... He'll he'll still say it though. <laughs> tough on China. <laughs> tough on China. Tough on, but also tough on trade. So then there's the you know classic Republican uh, nonsense of well these are job creators, and uh, but you don't really I mean you hear some of that in this clip. You, you you'll hear from Ducey I think the hint of the Trump move. Then you're gonna hear a little bit of job creator bullshit. But then you're gonna hear. Another line of argumentation about having $50 million in assets, which I don't think you've probably heard before. But we're not talking about just wealthy people. We're talking about super duper wealthy people who have well, assets of more than $50 million, right? Well, $50 million is big, but it's not as big as you think. And on those That's people... It's pretty big. That- yeah, well, yeah, but you wait and you work for Fox News long enough and you're 60 years old, you'll be surprised how much money you'll have. Yeah, but right. for people with 100 million, she wants it to be 3%, right. which these are absurd rates. You have to remember, these are the people that finance our startups. 
These are the people that give us companies <laughs> like Amazon and Apple, because they're the ones with the seed capital. See, they behave like these people sort of clip coupons, they have bonds, and they hang out right. at the row with the president and, you know, that sort of thing. That's just simply not true. They're very active people that are investing their money. Sure. <laughs> I think what a lot of us are saying is that most of these people have inherited money because we live in a rentier society. And if you read Thomas Piketty, you can see how much money is basically just rolled over in a feudal dynastic fashion. And also, whether you made it from starting a chain of grocery stores or clipping coupons for those grocery stores, uh, if you were at $50 million, you're getting taxed. I don't care how you made it, period. Yeah. Whether you are uh, you know, did something cool or something awful. Well, yeah, and... Whether you're a highly... What I mean by cool is like a basketball player, somebody who is like a highly compensated laborer, you're still going to get hit with that tax. And those are the people that I have like the least problem with them having money because they contribute something if we're going to live in a society like this. Yeah, totally. But most of the people with that kind of money are not basketball players. No, They're capitalists and other people's work made that money for them. And if there were any justice in this world, they would be completely expropriated because no one should be in that kind of a hierarchical position. Asking them to pay a wealth tax is like the tiniest, least bit that they deserve. No, fifty million dollars really isn't that much money. Yeah, and uh, for ninety-five percent of venture capital firms aren't profitable. Um, like this is a, it's right. a, it's a complete like um, they're playing with house money, frankly, and just hoping some like they get a unicorn or whatever they call them that can really cash out well because it gets acquired by one of these monopolies like Amazon. Yeah, that's Apple, how it works, basically. So the venture capital is a complete joke. Anybody who uh, acts like it's not is uh, trying to sell you something. Oh, it's also funny how he acts that like companies like Amazon are in any way making the world better for most of us. They're not. Fake news. Mark Zuckerberg and Pete Buttigieg. Mark Zuckerberg and Pete Buttigieg aren't making my life better. You're calling from an 805 area code. Who are you? Where are you calling from? Hi, this is Chris from Santa Barbara. Hey, Chris. What's going on? What's on your mind, man? So I was um, thinking recently about my political beliefs, and <laughs> I've noticed that most of my beliefs are basically what I've learned from watching shows like The Majority Report. Um, mm -hmm. I recently got Ben Burgess's book, um, nice. give them an argument Great. and I finished that. Terrific. And I was wondering for more literary, um, like things that I could explore to actually have like a more grounded knowledge. I would read, uh, I will, about. I would definitely read class notes by Adolf Reed Jr. Um, I would order that. I think everybody should read that. I'm a big history guy. Um, so I would read People's History of the Third World by Vijay Prashad. Um, and stay tuned. Against the Web, the globalist socialist case against the new right by Michael Brooks coming from Zero oh. Books in February. Nice. Get it. I'd, uh, I'd recommend the uh, Eric Hobsbawm uh, Age of series. You can mm -hmm. find all of those online as PDFs. So and uh, David Harvey's okay. Neoliberalism a History. Um, definitely that. Yeah, and if you prefer to take in information <clears throat> in audio form, David Harvey's lectures on Marxist capital definitely. are very good. Um, I think it's really important yeah. to have a basic grasp of Marxist concepts and Marxist economics. Um, it makes the mm -hmm. world make so much more sense. I don't want to sound like a cultist here, but it really, it really does. And then you start to notice You'll it. You'll start to understand. Chris. But there's like condensed versions if the full version is too long and boring and difficult. Um, I and only got through some. Oh, I, some of Richard Capital. Wolf has great. Uh, Richard I love. Wolf has I love stuff. long, boring, difficult. All right, perfect. Then you'll love Marx. There's also like a lot of crazy <laughs> shit in there. Like he he was writing at the time of the Gothic novel, so like there's a lot of Gothic imagery that I appreciate. There's um he just like goes off on coke fueled tangents, but um yeah, it's definitely a commitment. Thanks for the call, Chris. All right. Sounds good. Yeah. Have a good one. You too. All right. Uh, Ryan Grimm was on TMBS last week, and I frankly, I love Ryan and his work, and I can't wait to have him on again. And I said, stop being such a Warren cuck. And he, well, I didn't actually say that. We actually had, a, I, did, I thought one of the more smart 
conversation slash debates. I will say Ryan is a infinitely bigger Warren fan than me, as is Emma Viglin. And these are like the smartest Warren people. And they both still say Bernie should be at the top of the ticket. I think that that's pretty important information. Here's Ryan Grimm, though, who again, who is just, I mean, he's obviously his politics are of the left and he's a progressive and he's quite open about that. But he's also, I mean, he is first and foremost a very serious reporter. Um, so him laying out the reality of the just complete media erasure of the Bernie Sanders campaign on MSNBC with Chris Hayes, who of course is the only one who treats Bernie with some fairness on MSNBC is significant. The, the, the Sanders event, uh, Ryan, was, was in this context, you said, of the sort of plateau. And I think that the, the one kind of consistent polling story we've seen over the last three months is that Elizabeth Warren has gained across polling. That the challenge for the Sanders campaign, and I thought it was interesting them doing the event where they did it with the numbers they did, is that his challenge is just building out from the core they have. They obviously have a, a core of supporters extremely devoted. But I thought the last part of Riff of his speech was about fighting for people that don't look like you and like seemed to me a rhetorical leaning into the idea of addition to the coalition right. in a way I hadn't quite heard him make the case before. I mean, that's kind of been, been their kind of underlying case the entire time. Pause and it. the good news. I'm sorry. I mean, that's Ryan very politely saying you don't sound like you've been watching the speeches. I mean, that. I mean, that's certainly what it sounds like to me. I mean, Bernie, yes, that's a new formulation, but that's been the campaign from like how, day one. How would that follow? Like, there are lots of different kinds of people in the Bernie coalition already fighting for people who aren't like them. Well, like, that's well, what again, part of that implies that it's too small. That's always erased. And it's been part of socialist politics for ages. The case before. I mean, that's kind of been, been their kind of underlying case the entire time. And the good news for Sanders is that you can't survey his strategy. You know, in, in other words, pollsters look for likely voters. And the way that they look for likely voters is, you know, what's the electorate looked like in the past and what are our projections about it, what it's likely to look this time? Whereas Sanders is trying to change the complexion and the face of the electorate. So he's trying to organize enough people and inspire enough people you know, in Iowa, particularly to, to come out and caucus for Bernie Sanders, he's he's running up against this huge problem though, that I mentioned earlier of this media blackout. You know, in 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 the Democratic primary, this this network and the New York Times have an enormous amount of influence, and this this show in particular is an exception. It covers Sanders pretty regularly, but but outside of that, he often either gets ignored or or kind of just kind of laughed at as not a serious candidate, even when polls come out showing him, you know, in reasonable contention. Yeah. And, no, and one quick point on the Buddha judge, uh, he's spent an ex extraordinary amount of money in Iowa. And we can't forget yes. that because you can move the needle a few, you know, several yes. points by dumping a ton of money into a state. And he's been very smart about burning a ton of money in those states to make himself look viable until he becomes viable. Right. I mean, that's a very good point about, I mean, and really Buttigieg's only path to viability is that Iowa performance. And look, this is a hundred percent right. And this is where, you know, I, I, I'll say one concrete thing. I want, I would like the Sanders campaign to hire some, you know, really top notch outside television consultants to make ads that looked like the ones in 2016. That is an actual tangible thing that I think they can and should do to improve. But with regards to over 90% of what they have are supposed to do and what their task has been, this cycle they've achieved in terms of they're the only ones with a movement, they've built out and broadened their base, they're bringing the best policy set to the table, they have a theory of change that is plausible and hasn't been uh, tried before. All of these things are unparalleled in modern politics, at least going back to Jesse Jackson. Um, in terms of integrating all of them. Different campaigns have different pieces of them, but not the same synthesis and not to the same leftwardness, including the Jackson campaign. So you have all of that going on. What has been the problem? Well, the vast majority of the problem has been that they are dealing with a press that is viciously and relentlessly biased against them. And that has to be factored into 
their strategy. I don't know what all of the answer is to dealing with MSNBC and the New York Times. I don't know how you deal with having some trust fund kid cover them for the New York Times. I don't know how you deal with the endless bias against them on MSNBC and CNN. I think they need to more aggressively cultivate alternative networks, frankly. Uh, but that's the core problem, not anything they're doing. And so that is very important to uh, to be registered. I mean, you know, uh, just even, I mean, if any other candidate had a rally in Queens that got the biggest rally of the campaign season that had the most dynamic young politician in the United States of America, that would be full court coverage. And obviously, if it was Warren, it would be, f you know, double full court coverage. So, Absolutely. you know, let's just be real here. Um, there is an unbelievable bias and erasure. There's a tantrum anytime Nina Turner points out differences. And uh, they need to cultivate alternative networks and they need to be extremely aggressive and then just keep doing what they're doing because a lot of what they're doing is right. So I have a question. Mm -hmm. And that question is, how much do you think this mainstream media blackout is ultimately going to hurt Bernie's campaign considering the majority of people... I, I think the majority of working class people in this country, I'm not totally sure about this, don't trust corporate media. I think it, I think that things that, I think in a general election, the fact that Bernie has an independent brand from the Democratic parties to his advantage, I think that even the press stuff might be to his advantage in a general election. In a primary, I think Ryan Grimm is right. I think unfortunately, and you see this in the polling with, the huge astronaut, you know, the very wealthy people that congregate around Warren and Buttigieg and the conversations that get fed. I mean, to me, there's broad distrust, sure, but then it's like, it's not as powerful, but it's like, no, if, if, if Fox News doesn't like you and you're running in a Republican primary, that's tough. So I, I think that it, no, the bias against him and MSNBC and the Times matters. And it, and, and it does matter particularly amongst you know, conventional, like wealthy people who voted forever. That That is another part of the Sanders argument. He's trying to mobilize a totally new base. I could tell you anecdotally, he's achieving some of that, but I don't know at the scale. I mean, he needs to also have a fighting chance with all voters. And that's why, you know, it's incumbent upon people to read books and actually check out other news serve, you know, sources and don't just be a, you know, a, a cable uh, news regurgitator. You know, well, if you're watching this show, then clearly you're doing no, something right. Absolutely. No, I mean, independent news is legitimately important. And frankly, I think Ber Bernie should be Bernie should be doing appearances. On, I mean, he's done some. He's done this show. He's done Chapo. He's done Kyle Kalinske. But he should be doing way more on the independent. Story. Those those would be my dual print, uh, pincer strategy. I would say you get someone who makes incredible television ads who is a traditional consultant um, or whatever. I don't care where you find them, but just somebody who it doesn't matter what their ideology is. It doesn't matter what they're, they're in it for the check and they know how to make good fucking ads. You take the money you have, you blanket television, and maybe you counteract some of the relentless propaganda and erasure with fantastic advertising. You get people at least go, well, okay, that doesn't look like what I'm hearing about him all the time. Maybe I should check out his website. Maybe I should check out his social media. Then on the other hand, you aggressively cultivate the independent sphere in terms of your direct messaging and mobilization. I think that is what they should commit to. I mean, we can't be leaving any votes on the table here, but yeah, I feel like for at least a large chunk of the people who get their politics from MSNBC and CNN, they weren't going to vote for Bernie in the first place. It's a bad deal, folks. Yeah, I think just as a man, uh, for the sake of like your mental preservation, um, don't act like the media has a veto. They're gonna they're gonna continually screw Bernie over this entire process. Absolutely. But you know, you look at like the UK, like Corbyn, they, like the British press is nuts. And Insane. They're not insurmountable, basically. So. No, and I think I think that's really the only important part, though, is just so that you on the yeah. And so, but then that when somebody gives you some talking point they picked up from MSNBC about Bernie, you say, okay, I. I know what that is. That's bullshit. Here it is. Um, well, if Corbyn can face down the British press, given how psycho and bloodthirsty they are, maybe Bernie can face down the U.S. press. Well, I think they're going to need a bigger strategy. I mean, it's it's hurt Corbyn, but yes. Um, 
there's things to learn in both successes and failures. Um, and, and on the flip side, with the exception of Navara and some other outlets, there is not the same type of alternative ecosystem in the UK. So they really need to take advantage of that. This is Bernie and AOC talking about why she endorsed him. I, I mean, these questions are mind blowing. Like AOC and Ilan Omar have politics. That's why they endorsed Bernie Sanders. Uh, Bashkar Sunkar wrote a great piece in Guardian. If you like AOC, you should like Bernie. If you don't, you have to ask yourself why you treat politics as a, you know a, a, a prestige drama and not politics. AOC and Ilan Omar treat politics as politics. Here it is. What do you say to people who look at what happened with regard to your heart attack, look at the fact that you're the oldest candidate in the race, Fuck and you. wonder if you have the stamina for four years in office? Well, what I say is you look at the totality of a candidate. This is a record based on 30 and 40 years of fighting for the working families of this country. That's my record. Congresswoman, I know when the senator was in the hospital in Nevada, you called him. I did, yeah. Senator. Is that when you offered your endorsement? Yes. Why in that moment? I think it was a gut check for me. <laughs> you know, it was a real gut check and it's saying, and, and by the way, Neither me nor the senator cannot do this by ourselves. As a woman of color, why back an old white guy? And is this the future of the party? I'm actually Pause very excited. It. I mean, that is just... What the hell kind of question is that's that? That's a legitimately disgusting question on many levels. I mean, one, again, I will say, and I don't want to get too much down this road, it does erase him as a family of Holocaust survivors. And two... The real question is, is you're a self-identified democratic socialist who credits the rise of your political career to the 2016 campaign that you did grassroots organizing for. Bernie Sanders is a leading candidate carrying forward a democratic socialist vision. Why didn't you endorse him in February? Would be a coherent. And, I mean, it's yeah, actually question. kind of offensive to presume that somebody is going to endorse somebody else just because they're a woman of color. Well, I mean, that's what all of the, that's the subtext of all of it. No one has any, I mean, in, yeah, I mean, they don't take <clears throat> AOC's politics seriously at all. But the one that's, thing they yeah. can't do is act as if this is matter of fact because they need it to be mystified for the audience. So the right. audience doesn't see the easy connection because of ideology and right. policy. Exactly. Like, it's like, the last thing they ever want to talk about is real stuff. Like, like I always policy. thought the worst, like when I, when I was uh, taking math courses and a teacher would preface something like, this is really complex versus prefacing the exact same thing with I'm going to this is going to be simple and we're going to walk you through it. I think completely changes the way people go into a learning experience. 100%. And I think uh like they're by doing, they're mystifying by it, starting right? it with intimidation it's yeah, it's meant to keep people in the dark. Exactly. Right. Or why back an old white guy? And is this the future of the party? I'm actually very excited about this partnership because it shows what we have to do in our country is that we have to come together across race, across gender, across generation. Did you meet with other candidates before making your decision? I did, yes. Senator Warren? Yes. What was that conversation like? You know, I think she's a fabulous candidate. And so, frankly, Senator Sanders, Senator Warren, and myself are all on the same team in the party. If you are the nominee, Senator, would you consider the Congresswoman as your running mate? Well, I think I'm too young for that. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. She's answered. <laughs> would you work in a Sanders administration, a Sanders White House? Yes, you would. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know. I guess I know you asked. <laughs> All right, Nicole Killian. I mean, the question that will stick with me yes. is, as a woman <laughs> Let me color, guess. Let me guess. <laughs> Why well, endorse an old white guy? And she said with a straight face, yeah. and they both answered the question. Yeah. All, right. All right. Warren said after the endorsement. What? I feel like something was edited out of that answer, right? There was like a weird cut. There is an emergency need to read Adolf Reed in this country. Well, I mean, it's an emergency like, I mean, his you got to read the myth of economic reductionism in the New Republic. She, I mean, this... She this, was like halfway through her sentence when they cut her off, right? She was like, uh, people need to come together across lines of race and gender and age to cut. Like, oh, to do what? To fight for the working class. 
And I agree with AOC. It was a gut check. I, look, I still, frankly, I'm, I look, I think everybody should have endorsed Bernie immediately. This is a really important election. There's no other candidate like him. Warren does not represent that argument. And, well, it's uh, possible she was waiting until he needed a boost, like now. Yeah, but and he arguably might have, it did give him a boost. I wouldn't have had a heart attack if I had the endorsements immediately. I wouldn't have had to deal with all the fucking nonsense of this campaign. But I mean, no, I, I, I really, that fusion of essentialism and neoliberalism is always going to be the enemy of liberation of all. And of course, ironically, in a way that radically disproportionately affects people of color. I mean, that that's the sort of double grotesqueness. You know, Corey Reed has a new book coming out where he's like, look, if you if you basically if you if you did a new new deal in and dismantle and continue to formally dismantle american apartheid and then have aggressive affirmative action boom like on the material level you know i, I yeah i mean it's 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 so it's it is disgusting treatment of bernie and i do care about that because bernie's held the torch for 40 years while most of the modern political class was either doing nothing or terrorizing poor people and working people. But it's so unbelievably disrespectful to people like AOC who are actually showing that they have politics. They actually care about politics. With a straight face. They're here. They're doing real things. And the real people are showing up for the real campaign. Um, let's uh, play clip number three. Why not? That's fun, I guess. This is Rod Rodane Holler Report. Uh, I guess it's a montage of people agreeing with Bernie Sanders. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Mr. Bernie Sanders. Bernie Sanders is running out. That's right. You know, I saw Bernie's message and I said, this is the right direction. If he ran great four years ago. Bernie Sanders <laughs> brought enormous energy and... and new ideas and he, he, he pushed the party. He's out there, he fights from the heart. This is who Bernie is. And he has put the right issues on the table. I agree completely with Bernie about what the fundamental challenge we're facing as a country is. I want to give credit to Bernie. I'm a big Bernie Sanders supporter. I support Bernie Sanders to be our next president Aww. and commander in chief. There you go. I love Bernie supporters. I love Bernie. Bernie's a national hero that's helped move the country in the right direction. Thank you to Senator Sanders for his amazing leadership on this. You know, I also want to recognize uh, the work that Bernie has done on this. You brought us this far on Medicare for All. I support Medicare for All. I always have. Yes, I'm with Bernie on Medicare for All. I support Senator Sanders' Medicare for All bill. You go for universal health care. At least being <laughs> honest here and saying, oh how my he's god, all right, I can't, this. I can't even take this between like the people dishonestly associating themselves with him, and then like I like how Amy Klobuchar is like, well, at least he's being honest, he's trying to help people. I would like to honestly say that you all don't deserve shit. Um, that's primary Klobuchar style, seriously, primary Klobuchar. Um, that should be a big priority, folks. Uh, I like how Yang. Uh, Yang is my favorite, uh, you know, sort of. I guess we could call him crank candidate. Yes. Yang and and like it's frustrating because Yang's supporters could be Bernie supporters, and hopefully they will be after Yang drops out. Yeah. Yo, endorse Bernie Yang. Seriously, I mean, I have to say, like, obviously, first and foremost, look, if you identify on the left, uh, you support Sanders, not Warren. That's obvious, and that's like the big conflict there. Uh, but that two, three, four, five percent that you're wanking off with Gabbard or Yang, stop. This election matters. Get with Bernie. Stop fucking around. Yeah, um, you want a thousand dollars a month. Um, you, Yang's not going to win no matter what. But you know the stuff you're going to get from Bernie, hopefully, will be better than a thousand dollars a month. His workplace. This is beanbag. His workplace democracy plan actually could translate to several thousand a year for oh, a these people folks. don't have jobs <laughs> wow look at jamie with a very reactionary joke there <laughs> sorry yang gang I like that you know i love you they're not working and they bring a lot of problems you're calling from a 215 area code who are you where are you calling from uh this is mark from uh somewhere in pennsylvania 
Yeah. Hey, Mark, what's going on? Hey, um, so I wanted to call basically uh, just to officially announce that I'm done watching the Young Turks. Okay. They have lost a viewer after this moment. Okay. And the reason would be because of their, um, well, specifically Chink's um, very horribly inadequate um, coverage of the uh, developments in northern Syria right now. Okay. Um, well, I would just say, I mean, I, I, you know, I don't know what to tell you. I mean, I obviously, I know a lot of people there. And it's a, you know, it's, it's, I mean, even just on a personal level, there's bias um, from me. I think they do an incredible amount of good work. And I know that even with Jank, I know that there's pushback. And obviously I disagree with, from what I've seen of what Jank has said, which to be honest is very little. What did they say about Syria? I don't know what. I know it. I mean, I think Jank has a more Turkish well, sympathetic view, obviously, but mm. I, and I agree I, with I you, can, I mean, but I, I would still, look, that, I don't, but... I don't think, yeah, I don't, I don't know that that's really the best use of time, but I respect your decision to do that, <laughs> you know, but. Okay. I mean, right. thanks for the well, call. I mean, I, I guess, I guess a lot of, a lot of the decision has to do with, there are just so many other choices that I think are better choices at this time. And I think that okay. it's, it's Thanks not, for the um, it's not fully Appreciate because it. of this, but uh, okay. <laughs> I, yeah. All right. You're calling from a nine, seven, eight area code. Who are you? Where are you calling from? Michael. What's up, man? It's Eric from Jersey. Hey, Eric from Jersey. What's going on? What's on your mind? Hey, how are you? Jamie, Matt, how are you guys? Hey, we're all right. What's we're on good. your mind? Um, man? Yeah, there, you know, there's a topic I've been doing a lot of uh, reading and research about that I think would be good to cover, and I'd like to run it by you uh, okay. for, for a second. Uh, sure. I don't know if you think this would be something to just sort of flesh out a bit more, you know. Okay, um, tell me. And, uh, you know, it really intersects uh, so what human is health it? with climate change. Yeah, it's basically, so there's a disease called CKDU that no one's really talking much about. CKDU? It stands... Yeah, CKDU. It yeah. stands for Chronic Kidney Disease of Undetermined Etiology, and it's kind of an outdated term because the growing and overwhelming scientific consensus at this point is that it's being caused by climate change, which is frightening because we think about human diseases that will be caused by climate change maybe at the turn of the century or 2100, but this has been happening since the 1990s. Right. And uh, primarily it's affecting agricultural workers in the developing world. And, uh, right. Right. This was first reported in the early 1990s. At the time, it was really looked at through the lens of like occupational disease. They said, oh, it's pesticides, it's agrochemicals, it's heavy metal exposure, blah, blah, blah. And then it was, you know, the evidence doesn't really bear that out. So, no, no, it's, you know, maybe it's epigenetic phenomenon and so on and so forth. And at this point, it's basically undeniable. And uh, just quickly, the putative mechanism is that the rate at which temperatures are sustained at sort of higher, um, increasing record level temperatures is outpacing the human body's capacity for physiological acclimatization to, you know, the ambient conditions. And these people are basically suffering from daily subacute kidney injuries for oh, years. Jesus, it's horrible. They develop I mean, obviously they develop climate and the environment are going to have a big effect and already do on human health, but that's a really interesting, disturbing way of, of looking at it. Yikes. Um, thanks for the call, man. Yeah. Appreciate it. I just assume yeah, no all of the old diseases are going to come back, like cholera, you know? We're just going to have like a full on. You want it to come back. You want, you want it to come back. You want you want to write some novel about it. You want you want cholera. You wish you lived in the age of cholera. Wow. You're calling, Savage. You're calling from an 847 area code. Who are you? Where are you calling from? Hi, my name is Josh, and I'm calling from Chicago. Josh from Chicago. What's up? What's on your mind? Uh, well, first of all, I'm actually about to join the line in a little bit. Uh, I'm sorry, Chicago, totally so, lost. Uh, what is solidarity. it? Solidarity. You're about to what? What? I'm about to join the teachers on the picket line in a little bit. Awesome. So solidarity to them. Awesome. But um, I wanted to call because I was also at the um, the rally on uh, Saturday, and I wanted to actually share what I thought was like one of the most powerful things. Mm -hmm. um, I loved when Tiffany Caban spoke. She talked about how AOC inspired her to run. Right. 
And it's like, you know, and for me, it's talking about the power of a movement. And then when AOC talks, she talks about how Bernie inspired her to run. And to me, that is, in, in essence, the biggest endorsement um, Bernie can get. Because um, you show, without <laughs> AOC, we, without Bernie, we wouldn't have someone like AOC, probably. And without AOC, right. we wouldn't have someone like Tiffany. And mm-hmm. I think, for me, that's the power of a movement right there. That's the power of someone basically inspiring someone to run. And that's sort of, you see different levels of a movement, sort of, I, I don't want to use the word trickling down, because I associate it with trickle-down economics. But you see, you basically see the, the power of a movement going down to different levels and different areas of a movement working within each other. Um, I don't know if you, you noticed that. Um, yeah, no, I, I think, piece, I but, mean, I noticed, yeah, I mean... I notice it just more generally that like, like I saw some, you know, some embarrassing, I don't even remember, probably some demo, some, some mediocre something or other person tweeting out, quote, tweeting AOC's endorsement video of Bernie, where she talks about the multiracial, multi-generation working class coalition. And this person tweeted out and said, well, I agree with AOC, but I don't think Bernie's capable of building that movement. Oh, and God, it's like, I that. Yeah, it already good. happened. Like, you know, that's the, yeah. I mean, maybe this is like an important time to reset the conversation. Will that movement win the presidential election? That is under question. Will it be an effective strategy that can overcome American oligarchy? That is an open question. Does the movement already exist and have millions of people participating in it as evidenced by everything from Bernie's organizing with Walmart and Amazon to more individual contributions than any other candidate of every party to like, yeah, it already exists. So again, I don't know whether people, when I read stuff like that, I, I the God's honest truth is I don't know whether people are being stupid or they're gaslighting or they're, you know, make, or they're making up weird ideas in their own heads about what that actually means just so they can, you know, play a fake game in their heads that, uh, you know, that obscures Bernie or, but, you know, yeah, they're mostly gaslighting would be my guess. And, you know, obviously it's stupid and insincere and dishonest, but I think that, um, yeah, I mean, it, it exists and that shine through in the rally. I mean, I happen to think like, you know, it's every possible metric if you're just talking about policy. And I refuse to concede foreign policy, which is something that a lot of people are showing themselves to be yeah, quite yeah. comfortable doing. But yes, if your if your thing is there needs to be mass movement politics that intersects with federal power at the highest level, you have one option. It already exists. And everything else is theoretical. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, you know, and, and, and again, it was, yeah, it was just the truth. I mean, and that's exactly how it works. Bernie paves the way for AOC. Yeah, I, AOC paves the way for Tiffany Caban. Then you also, by the way, you had a, multi, a bunch of, uh, you know, state progressive state legislators uh, that represent a variety of districts and, and uh, you know, uh, across the state. I put Nina Turner. That's it. So there's an option. You know, that's it. There's one yeah. option. If you, That's what you're about. If you're not, then I guess you're not. Thanks for the call. I, I would only add that the trickle goes both ways. You know, like the Bernie Sanders campaign wouldn't have been possible without a grassroots upswell in working class politics going back to Occupy Wall Street and probably even before that. And then in turn, he's uh, inspired people to join the movement who probably wouldn't have otherwise. So there's always going to be a lot of give and take. I've talked to at least two people, maybe three, who became full time professional union organizers because of 2016. And there's no question, of course, his campaign, there was material conditions and there was an upsurge of, of, of momentum. But the truth is, is that, you know, a successful presidential campaign, especially with his mentality, I mean, he wanted to turn it into something that would continue. It wasn't just a vanity project, which it is for 99.9% of these people. So, oh, yeah. I mean, I joined yeah. DSA in November of 2016, along with a whole bunch of other people. And it had a lot to do with Trump as well as Bernie. Absolutely. Um, I would like to start having Ben Carson lead prayer meetings for me. I, I like his approach. And ben, and uh, Donald Trump does too. You can see why Ben Carson is still... By the way, God knows what Ben Carson is doing to HUD. 
in a country where there's a huge amount of homelessness and housing is a crisis that affects millions of people. Uh, but Donald Trump sure does love these cabinet prayer meetings led by, or uh, uh, prayers led by Ben Carson. Please do the honors. <laughs> Our kind Father in heaven, we're so thankful for the many blessings that you have bestowed upon us in this country. In this country. And we're thankful for the people of courage who have been here before us, who have fought hard for the rights of our country. Who have been indicted. And we thank you for <laughs> President Donald Trump, who also exhibits great courage in face of constant criticism. We ask that you would give him strength to endure and the wisdom to lead and to recognize you as the sovereign of the universe with the solution to everything. And the people around the president, the vice president, the cabinet, the advisors, give us all an understanding heart and a compassionate heart. Those are the things that will keep America great and help us all to recognize as a nation He's reading this. That separation of church and state means that the church does not dominate the state, and it means the state does not dominate the church. I'm a big believer in Christianity and religion. To promote <laughs> godly principles. Yes. Of loving your fellow man. Of caring about your neighbor. Except that of developing your God-given talents to the utmost that you become valuable to the people around you having values and principles that govern your life. And if we do those things, then we will always be successful. And we thank you for hearing our prayer in your holy name. Amen. Amen. Yeah, thank you, Ben. That was a great job. <laughs> Appreciate it. Uh, the economy is doing fantastically well. <laughs> what can we even add to that? Thank you, Ben. That was a great job. Just beautiful. Just beautiful. That was deep, Ben. You're right. I am constantly criticized. <laughs> Thanks for working on Constantly that criticized. And if you keep up the negativity, then it's going to be very bad for the country. Anyways, economy, great. A monuments clause, fake. He's Con just like Jesus. I'm a lot like Jesus in a certain sense, except more clean cut. Yeah, got better clothes. Better clothes. Bill Gates earned 97,000, this is a Colorado guy, 97,000 times more than the average Microsoft employee last year with an average Microsoft employee salary of being, of, uh, being $118,000. We can't let numbers like this get us down or make us see the world as glass half empty, but rather glass half or as we say reserved for the Koch brothers' grave plots, half full. Much love, MR crew. Feel the burn. Eat the rich. Lula Livre. Yeah, it's more like glasses you're legally not allowed to drink from overflowing. <laughs> exactly. Oh, my God. I'm sorry. I was trying not to do this. This I am literally reads, Michael, I beg you, make fun of Sam Crowbar and get to the interview that he's the only white guy in an otherwise black show. <laughs> So I was on it was on the WB and it was and it was a sitcom where I was the right the white writer on a black show and I was the star. I would watch that. I feel like online. do we even need to watch it? I Is mean, it we, available? I think we really know the story pretty Maybe. well. Colin from Nebraska. Bernie needs to announce Nina Turner as VP soon. First major endorsement, first VP announcement equals Iowa. Well, I'm, we'll see. I mean, I'm totally down with Nina. I'm not sure how much of a difference it would make in terms of winning Iowa, but I'm totally down. She's I'm, great. She's awesome. She's my pick. On a political level, if you did like Stacey Abrams, it would make more of a splash. Although, frankly, like I don't, I don't see, like Stacey Abrams is great. Andrew Gillum is great. There's a lot of, like, well, actually not a lot. That's There's basically two <laughs> dynamic young talent in the Democratic Party. I really can't think of. There's basically like the squad and then Castro I have mixed feelings he's on. He's been auditioning for it. Though. Castro's auditioning. Like... Castro's put some points on the board. And then you have 
three out of four of the squad and then Gillum and Abrams and then, yeah, and then the squad. But I don't really... Well, Talib didn't actually endorse Bernie yet. Well, I'm actually just... Go- I Forget it. I, I'm Actually, I just should say by political talent, there's the squad. I was saying three in terms of like good politics, but four in terms of talent. So, you know, and then Rokana. So there really is not much out there. There are so few options. But I would... No, I, me, I would pick Nina Turner. And this I would. Is, this I think Nina Turner is fantastic. This is why I'm torn about it. Because normally the vice president isn't actually that important of a job and like chief of staff, it would probably be a place where she could make more impact. However, like if Bernie dies in office, God forbid, we want the vice president to be someone with politics as good as his. And there aren't that many choices that would qualify for that. And she's one of them. That's the truth. India and Pakistan have exchanged fire across the line, dividing the disputed Himal- uh, Himalayan region of Kashmir on Saturday and Sunday, killing nine civilians and soldiers, according to authorities in both countries. This is a report in the Washington Post. It was one of the deadliest consequences this year of the line of control, the highly militarized frontier where soldiers from the two countries regularly trade small arms and artillery fire. The barrage came amidst the tension increase between the two nuclear armed rivals. So, just to set this up a little bit, as we've been covering, and we know a couple of months ago, the BJP far-right Hindutva government of Narendra Modi scrapped the provision in the Indian constitution going back to the days of Nehru, which allowed for uh, essentially a certain degree of cultural autonomy in Kashmir. I apologize if I'm mispronouncing that. Kashmir already has been for decades maybe the most militarized place on earth. And regularly the Indian military subjected local populations to significant, uh, really, really horrifying and systemic rights abuses. And I I won't actually spell them out here, but people can look them up and uh, very, 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 very vicious stuff. And then you have a small part of Kashmir that is owned, that is in possession of Pakistan. Uh, and this is another source of tension between Pakistan and India. I'm assuming everybody knows that it was one country before partition, right? And partition after independence from uh, the British Empire, partition happened. It created Pakistan as a Muslim state, um, a Mus- a theoretically a Muslim democracy, but one to sort of protect the identity of Muslims. There's been a long-standing conflict in India between a tradition of pluralism that reflects the unbelievable sort of diversity and democracy of India, and then a far-right current that is rooted, you know, like all fascism, in an imagined past and actually borrowed freely both from Israeli nationalism and Hitlerian uh, politics. When you go to the RSS, the RSS is the paramilitary uh, non-governmental organization that basically is an umbrella for the BJP political party of which Modi is a part of. You go back to 2002, Modi, uh, at the very least, um, negligent, almost certainly, in my opinion, complicit in a mass murder of Muslims that took thousands of people's lives in a matter of hours. So this remains the most likely place on earth for there to be a nuclear exchange. The Pakistanis definitely have supported terrorist groups inside Kashmiri uh, areas, and they definitely, even going back to most hor- horrifically, the um, attack on the Oberoi Hotel in 2018, where a group of um, Pakistani government basically went through the streets of Mumbai, machine gunning people to death, then took over the Oberoi Hotel and just tried to basically kill as many people as possible. That was almost certainly conducted with the support active of Pakistani intelligence. So this is the context of what's happening now. And even as we have this playing out, Narendra Modi is still globally feted. He recently was rewarded uh, recognition from the Gates Foundation for in fact, a very successful initiative he oversaw in India for clean toilets across the country. It's true and a success of the government this while erdogan is ethnically cleansing kurds it would be a weird time to you know award him for like a successful anti-smoking initiative that would be the pretty direct uh, analogy here's a photo i don't know where this was taken um tony blair who it was taken in hell tony blair i mean look tony blair <laughs> was the point person 
for hack liberals in the United States who had all the same bloodlust, but just didn't want to support George W. Bush because the guy was so stupid. And Tony Blair came along and he pronounced the Arabic names correctly in his Regency drama accent. And he made the human rights case for the invasion of Iraq, the human rights case to remove Saddam Hussein, an invasion that culminated conservatively in hundreds of thousands of civilians deaths, soldiers deaths, displacement, civil war, everything else. Tony Blair has worked for the Saudis, for I believe the Kazakh government. He's advised General al-Sisi. Um, he is nothing more than at home in the world of oligarchs and dictators in his post-premiership. Here he is with Narendra Modi, Condoleezza Rice, John Howard, the Australian uh, Iraq invasion backer, some guy I don't recognize. Who's the guy between Howard and uh, Rice? Do you know who that is? Is it uh, Gates? Robert I, oh yeah, Gates. Robert Gates, the former CIA director under-, under uh, You know what these people call themselves? And Henry Kissinger, of this course. This is the J.P. Morgan International Council. Oh my God! So, uh, yep. Yes, you need to. Yep. If um, that's... Tony Blair immediately went on the J.P. Morgan board. I think he also. I think he also advises a Hennessy Moe. So he's got all some of these cool... uh, banks should be uh, nationalized. All of these banks should be nationalized, and all of these people should be. I, I'm arrested. not a prison abolitionist. Lock <laughs> them up. Lock them up. Lock them up. If that's not a cursed name and image, I don't know what is. Sorry, I should have, I should have warned everybody before before showing a clip of Damien. Uh, yeah, I needed a trigger warning. Right. You're calling from a seven six zero area code. Who are you? Where are you calling from? Hi, my name is Pastor. Uh, I'm from Humboldt County, California. Pastor. Yes. Hey. It's a Hungarian well, name. Calling from Humboldt County. What's going on? How's the weed? How's growing season? Honestly, it was better back home. Where <laughs> I was know home? That's kind of weird about this. Uh, Palm Springs. My neighbor grew it. Wow, Palm Springs had, better I weed than Humboldt connect. County. Hot I was just tape. there. I know. All right. Well, well what's I'm, on your I'm, mind? Uh, I'm here to talk about um, this month is Mental Awareness Month and um, by extension ADHD Awareness Month. And mm -hmm. I'd just like to talk about that for a little bit. Okay, yeah. Go for it. So um, first things first, I'd like to um, explain that ADHD is a lot uh, more impactful than people realize. It's not just a learning disability. It impacts every single part of your life. Um, so actually, uh, trigger warning, this is going to involve suicide. Um, childhood suicide is more associated with ADHD than depression. Um, it's also, um, I'd like to ask a favor for you guys too. Um, you guys use like ADHD and PTSD and the word triggered as a joke a lot. Mm -hmm. And in my experience, I did not think my ADHD was that big of a deal. And it's because society doesn't think it's that big of a deal. So when people, especially progressives like you guys, use that, those kinds of terms as a joke, it really um, shows to people who suffer with those things and people who aren't informed about it that it is a joke and it's not that big of a deal. And well, I, 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 let me just, triggered, I, I just want to say, I mean, I, I well, the word triggered is used in a variety of different ways and some of them definitely are worth joking about. But I think with ADHD, um, I don't know about PTSD. I, I want to be really clear here. Definitely use triggered as a joke sometimes i don't think we've ever used i know i've never used ptsd as a joke that's a very serious thing and adhd i you know i'll say that there's people extremely close to me uh who have that diagnosis and i think they carry it differently so i i can't you know i i can't universalize from what you're saying but i hear you and it's something that we can definitely explore more. I, I appreciate the call. Do you have anything else real quick to add? Um, just to um, just try to make, make ableism and that kind of terminology a regular occurrence in your, um, in your show, I think it's really important that we uh, interpret and include people who aren't able okay. to discuss. So that's, that's just it. And it is, 
ADHD Awareness Month, please look at the hashtag on Twitter. Uh, if you have ADHD or if you're wondering about it, Googling it honestly gives you a lot of wrong information. Um, so go to the hashtag on Twitter. Thanks for well, the call. Here's, okay, can I just say one thing? I have been diagnosed with ADHD, and I think it's okay to joke about it. I joke about it sometimes. I mean, I... I Again, I'm I'm talking like family members, so I'm not gonna like you know, but like, that's the first person I've ever heard who has ADHD, um, and I myself might have some of it. Uh, who doesn't? You know, I I've never heard that before. So you know, all I can say for that sort of thing is, it's not gonna change you know how we joke and the language we use, but it's obviously not you know, there's clearly no malice behind it and. You know, you. I think it's important. You know, to like right there. There's two perspectives right in the room of like how people feel about. And I, but I'm also I'm genuinely a little bit confused. I definitely make fun of people saying triggered, which I definitely will continue to do. Um, but I don't know. Do we joke about PTSD or ADHD? I honestly am not aware of that. I mean, it's not a common theme, at least. Maybe just like using it colloquially to describe things that aren't actually that. I guess. Yeah. I mean, I tend to think that all these th these sorts of conversations uh, end up surrounding what um, needs to be addressed through, you know, material means. Definitely. I mean, so, you know, look at the hashtag and look at there's there's resources for sure. I mean, that that is definitely I agree. Um, you're calling from a 760 area code. Who are you? Where are you calling from? Hi, this is Jonathan calling from Oceanside. Jonathan from where? Oceanside. Hey, Jonathan, uh, what's San on your Diego, mind? California. What's on your mind? <clears throat> Hi. Um, uh, so, um, one, I've been trying to uh, call in for uh, a long time, probably about two months on and off. It's really hard to get through to this show, what's your, um, uh, which is yeah, fantastic. Yeah. What's, but, uh, what's um, on your mind? <laughs> uh, so, um, so this goes back. Uh, I preface that because this goes back like two months ago. But anyway, so um, yeah, what's on your mind? Uh, I, <laughs> so uh, the um, uh, with the college athletics, and um, I know that this has not been on the show at all today. And please, stay again, this later. goes back a while. But mm -hmm. so with the college athletics, and and uh, mm -hmm. you know, students getting uh, college athletes getting paid. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I think that. The kind of the main thing that gets lost in the shuffle is that, you know, um, with, you know, men's football and men's basketball and um, some others, which are definitely profitable. And mm -hmm. uh, I think, you know, I think that that all college athletes should get some type of stipend yep. so that they're not, you know. <laughs> so yeah, college they're, they're athletes should definitely and, be paid. I and, totally agree with right, that. But you right. have a just... And, but I, let's try to yeah, stick a so landing I think here. The, prob the, pro yeah. the problem with, uh, with the, the kind of the talking points about this, especially kind of coming from shows like this and coming from the left is that, you know, um, when you talk about like, Oh, well, college athletics are so profitable. So you don't like think that. all like, college athletes college should get paid. You think only in certain sports, no, is that what you're saying? I think that, I think, I think that they should all get stipends. Okay, so they should all um, so get stipends, but they shouldn't but I, get paid. Just, just like let, clarify the point. Yes. Okay. Right. Right. I think should, that I, don't, I, don't I think, think the amount of money that goes paid. through. I think the amount of money that goes through, particularly basketball and football, the idea that you wouldn't pay those students, it, to me, is, I, I mean, it's literally feudalism on some level. I can't abide it. I, I, it's insane. Sure. So sure. I, 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 I'm, I, it's, I guess just, but, it's just a bridge I can't pa cross, I, but I appreciate the call, man. Thanks. I think I, I don't know what to say about that. There's just, there's a massive amount of money. I mean, these are nationally televised events with sponsors with an insane amount of resource. I think they should be paid. Yeah. I mean, generally make college free anyway. Um, so right. that like Fox news can stop saying, well, they're given a free education and then like the, the the schools that are making a lot of bank on players uh, should that they should share those profits. I well, mean, sit, sit down, Brendan. I think the concern that he was making, if yes. he was, if we gave him all the time in the world to make it, would be that <laughs> there are programs that make all the money, and how do you distribute that? And I do think that like 
progressive shows don't really have like an answer to that yet or i haven't heard one in terms of distribution well i mean because it it is basketball and football that make all the money i mean look i i think it's pretty easy to say if you are getting recruited to play basketball or football you get paid if you're a walk-on playing water polo i don't know maybe you won't get paid (laughs) like i think like i just think like in actuality these distinctions are pretty easy to make right i agree i agree with that you know i think there's certain likes like tiptoeing around it when we talk okay if you're playing basketball or football you should get enumerated a lot if you're in college if you are playing tennis maybe it depends depends on what division you're in i mean i you know i I don't know if this, like, I, I, I take the point. I don't know if, like, the best use of our time is try to, like, create, like, a Figure out what bullet their rep- point plan for how the NCAA should handle compensation. I'm just saying, if you are watching Syracuse play in the Final Four and you're going to a commercial for McDonald's, Coke, Nike, and those kids are not getting paid a goddamn thing, uh, you should pay them. That's it. I mean, and also what the players like can get individual um, endorsement deals. They should be allowed to do that. And that would, I mean, frankly, clear up a lot of this where you have like the, the Duke guys, right. That are frankly bringing in probably a lot more profit for their school than like the Gonzaga guys even. I mean, I mean, obviously a a lot of these schools are, but like then they can, uh, I mean, I, I, I also take the caller's point, but basically like they got to figure out revenue sharing. Like, they got to, yeah. They gotta I mean, figure and, out revenue and this sharing. status quo where until we figure that out, it, it rebounds to the coaches and the athletics department. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing to me is it just seems like, sure, that's a horizon problem to figure out. The emergency is that they're not getting paid. And that's what. And there's to. a massive, yeah, exploitative profit being made. All right, you're calling from a two one zero area code. Who are you? Where are you calling from? Did you say two one zero? Hi, yes. Cody. Hey, Cody. Hi, this is Cody from San Antonio. Hey, what's on your mind? Hey, man. Um, I was going to mention one piece of media, and then I want to ask you a quick question. Okay. Um, there's a guy named. Here, let me get off speakerphone. Sorry about that. Oh, well, that would be great. Thanks. Okay. Um, for sure. So there's a gentleman named uh, Robert Evans. He's a pretty good uh, journalist. He works over at uh, for iHeartMedia. Um, got a few podcasts out. Got a book out about eighth, or, uh, fascism. Um, mm-hmm. He also works with a podcast with uh, Katie and Cody from uh, some more news. They do a show uh, called Worst so, Year Ever. Anyway, yeah. he was just uh, yeah. They they were uh, he was just recounting to them. Robert Evans was recounting to them about um, he did a long trip to. Uh, Rojava and that whole area. Mm-hmm. Um, very deep podcast. Um, I think you guys would enjoy hearing that. What's the name of the sort of and thing? It's, uh, um, oh, it's it's Cody and uh, sorry, Katie what? and Cody and uh, Robert Evans. The show is called Worst Year Ever. It's, Worst Year uh, Ever. It's on Spotify and shit. Okay. Yeah. Cool. All right. Um, that's a great one. Yeah, I I I would recommend that for you. Um, just secondly, um, I argue with my dad a lot about uh, you know, he's conservative. I've kind of talked about it before. Mm-hmm. He's uh. When it comes to, you know, Saudi Arabia, basically, um, and, you know, the murder of an American journalist and everything else going on with them, I won't get into it. Um, I always advocate for um, if Russia or no, not Russia, if Saudi Arabia wants to be, you know, as evil as they are in pursuit of capital over human lives and we don't necessarily have to stand for them. They can uh, F off to the Russian market for um Kind of in just in my opinion, you know, if we have to, I'm tired of aligning with, you know, sort of access well, it's not powers about, like that. I mean, I mean, it's capital. not about. But I'm wondering what you think about that. What are the risks? About not aligning. Well, I mean, the, first of all, I mean, Saudi and I mean, we buy a, a oil from from Saudi and depend on them for it. And Russia is, you know, produces its own, you know, energy needs uh, as well. I mean, Russia and Saudi do have a fine relationship. If you want to. I mean, I, I guess I have a little bit of a problem with the frame. I mean, Saudi Arabia is abominable, but, you know, we're abominable. And I don't think that there's something kind of like, I mean, there are distinct things about the Saudis as a monarchy, but there's distinct things about Israel as an apartheid state, can I, right? But I think that... Uh, can I quickly restate I, something? I just think what you need to do if you want to have a change relationship with Saudi Arabia is you need to move, you do need to have a different energy economy. If you don't have a different energy economy, it's not going to be viable. Sure. 
If I can jump in with one more question here, I appreciate that very much. Um, sure. I guess I, I didn't make it necessarily clearly. Um, what I am more, you know, that's that's very relevant on Saudi and the oil and everything. But what I'm more concerned about is um, if we, you know, if we divest from Saudi and they they go off to Russia, you know, without anything a like a Green New Deal going down or something. They have a relationship with Russia. They already have a relationship. What I'm trying to say is you got, it's a global economy. It's globally connected. They have a relationship with Russia. And if you want to do something like a Green New Deal, it's going to include That's partners. That's kind of my point too, my Well, dad. it's going to include partnerships with a place like Russia and even, frankly, a place like Saudi because all of these emirates and all of these Gulf states are going to need to actually ask themselves. They have paid off parts of their populations and they're able to preserve literally having monarchies in the 21st century because they sit on an unbelievable amount of wealth. What happens when that changes? If they haven't diversified their economy, if they don't have a whole other set of plans and strategies for how to succeed in the 21st century. So it's a conversation that needs to involve everybody. Thanks for the call, man. Sure. Appreciate it. Um, all right, I was going to get to some sound, but uh, it's okay. It's all right, Brandon. No, don't worry about it. It's cool. Just wait for Matt. It's fine. Take one more call. You're calling from an 845 area code. Who are you? Where are you calling from? Uh, hello? Hello. Uh, hello? Hello. What's your name? Where are you calling from? Anderson. I'm calling from uh, Suffern, New York. Hey, Anderson. What's on your mind? Uh, I just wanted to ask, um, you know, I think I, I definitely support Bernie, mm -hmm. but, you know, in, in the eventuality, well, in the possibility that, you know, he doesn't win, what do you think he'll be doing um, if he didn't A, win? If he didn't win, or, he will campaign for the Democratic nominee and keep working on the issues. Thanks for the call. Um, attorney Frank, attorney Andrew, frankly, if we don't have a drop of money is power, motherfucker, for TMBS, I'm not sure what we're doing here. It's a good point. Who said money? Where is that from, though? What is that drop? Jake the Snake. Hey, MR crew. I've heard all of you criticize firms like McKinsey in the past. I'm a student in a scholarship program that's pushing first generation students in color into internships at places like McKinsey. Can you explain your criticism of McKinsey or do you have resources to look into? Yeah, I mean, listen back to the interview I did on what McKinsey is doing in Puerto Rico as one standalone. I mean, or look, read anything about private equity. Or read anything about private equity. What? Or their work in Saudi Arabia with the crown prince. I mean, look, let me just draw a distinction here. If, if you as a college student working your way through things, like I'm not like a moralist, like take the internship if that helps you on your journey. But there's a insane amount of resources on the profoundly destructive role that McKinsey plays on everything from destroying public schools in Puerto Rico to massive restructuring uh, in U.S. corporations that cost a ton of jobs to them as sort of like essentially agents of, of capitalism across the globe in a way that's bad. Um, yeah, economic you know, hitmen. You might they're economic hitmen. They are. You can use them for your job needs without drinking the Kool-Aid. Yeah. So I would just say, yeah. So I want to be super clear about that. I'm never telling anybody like, don't take a job or whatever. Yeah. That we don't go after the individual. Yeah. 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 So, but socialists. Right. But if you want to check out, read about it, there's tons of resources. Um, let's see. Let's see. What should we do here? All right. Let's do, this is a good piece of sound. Let's go to number eight or excuse me number 10 we talked yesterday about the protests that are taking place in lebanon uh which are fundamentally taking on a sickness with neoliberalism and austerity and it's significant because they're cross-sectarian uh and this is journalist uh kareem chiabe che cheab on democracy now elaborating on the protests since Thursday night, protests have swept Beirut following a cabinet decision to add further regressive taxes 
to um, help balance the Lebanese budget, which is going through a massive, which has a massive deficit. Um, news outlets used a WhatsApp tax as sort of the straw that broke the camel's back. What happened that night started with a protest that went around Beirut, but following an incident where the bodyguards of the education minister fired warning shots and dispersing the crowds, we suddenly heard and saw protests across the country erupt like never before, across major cities and towns, and people blocking major highways across the country. And Karim Sha Shaheb, th these protests have occurred not only in uh, Beirut, but in other areas of the country where uh, Hezbollah is the, is the main political uh, and, and governmental force. I'm wondering, uh, are the protests now spreading throughout the country? Absolutely. So, following the incidents of last Thursday night, we have seen protests across the country, including in areas which are considered key political areas for parties like Hezbollah and their allies Amal, such as Sur, Bintishbel, Nabati, and others. Uh, this is rather unprecedented, uh, considering that many of them have been critical of both parties, especially Amal, and there's been a bit of nuance on Hezbollah, which I've never seen before in those areas in particular. We have seen some cases of people attacking uh, the signs and offices of MPs belonging to both parties. So this is something that's very unique for Lebanon, because despite Lebanon having a relatively vibrant civil society in the region, especially in Beirut, it remains centric to the capital. But here we are, we're seeing protests across the country calling for, at least the vast majority of the people calling for the downfall of the government. Yeah, and I think that that's actually an interesting thing even with regards to Hezbollah. Hezbollah, that has that very Sunni, um, kind of justice, Shia justice, not Sunni, Shia justice discourse has actually been extremely integrated with its own forms of global capital um, and its own way, its own sort of modes of governance. Um, and they've sort of changed uh, and reflected those broader dynamics in Lebanon. So this movement is, it's powerful. It's really exciting. We'll see what it yields. And it does parallel Sudan and Iraq. Um, Donald Trump is whining a lot and impeachment is not something apparently that he wanted some of us thought you know maybe this would be a great opportunity for him he'll see it as an opportunity to mobilize his base but you know oxum's razor a petty egomaniac is not happy about um getting impeached trump tweeted this um, today, I believe. So, uh, so someday if a Democrat becomes president and a Republican wins the house, even by a tiny margin, they can preach the president without due process or fairness or any legal rights. I don't know what he means. All Republicans must remember that what they are witnessing here, a lynching, but we will win. Obviously, hugely offensive to have this unbelievably racist and racial arsonist president throwing that term around when he finally gets into some heat for his criminal conduct. Here's Congresswoman Karen Bass explaining just in fact how offensive it is. Whenever his back is against the wall, a racial bomb is what we know of him to throw. You think this is racist? I mean, I think it's consistent. Why would you use the term lynching? Why would you say that? What do you think? Well, I think because he throws out race, because he knows it's red meat, and he has done that consistently. That's it, and it's amazing. Like I, The fact that CNN keeps having to restate the obvious when what this congresswoman is saying is available to any sentient human being to understand is, it's CNN. Well, he's appropriating it in a racist way. Then let's go to, of course, Lindsey Graham. Lindsey Graham's got no problem with this. Our national media, when it's about Trump, who cares about the process as long as you get it? So, yeah, this is a lynching in every sense. This is un-American. I've never seen a situation in my lifetime as a lawyer or something. A lynching in every sense. Yeah. In every sense. That's a very historically aware for a fucking Southern senator to say this. Yeah, South Carolina. So disgusting. Yeah, he knows. Process. He knows exactly what he's doing. Get it. So, yeah, this is a lynching in every sense. This is un-American. I've never seen a situation in my lifetime as a lawyer where somebody's accused of a major uh, 
misconduct who cannot confront the accuser, call witnesses on her behalf, and have the discussion in the light of the day so the public can judge. If this continues in the House, it's a complete sham, and I will do everything I can to make sure it doesn't. This guy helped impeach President Clinton for sex. I like the Republican suggestion that lynchings and witch hunts are un-American. Yeah, right? lynching and witch hunts, what do they have to do with America? Unbelievable. It really is just so disgusting. Well, that's the whole thing about the the, the Republican mindset. It's 100% projection. It's 100% persecution complex. And it's 100% um, accusing other people of doing to them what they have done and want to do to others. As uh, a great uh, mind once said, uh, look what you made me do. <laughs> a great mind who's pretty, uh, pretty much voting D across the board. Pretty much, although I think there's some cuckishness to Taylor Swift. Oh, yeah. You're calling from a 469 area code. Who are you? Where are you calling from? Hey, uh, is this me? Yes, this is you. What's your name? Where are you calling from? Okay. Hey, yeah, I'm G from Texas. Hi, what's on your mind? Uh, I, I mean, I guess this may be kind of an holistic view, but considering like the thing uh, you guys have been talking about for the past couple of days on the show, like how we are, you know, essentially trying to rebuild the New Deal coalition, and you know, with Bernie and trying to take this further, addressing the issue of capitalism, like aren't we just going back to and trying to get how things were like honestly the problem is i don't see us being able to especially with the current american culture to move things further than that so i don't know yeah, what you I'm mean kind by of where things were i don't know what you mean where things were what do you mean oh uh so you've been talking about uh essentially like uh, i think it was on yesterday's show where you guys were discussing about uh building the coalition again like kind of well, the New Deal new, coalition it's, that a got new, apart. it's a new okay. coalition. It's a new coalition because mm -hmm. <clears throat> if you go back, you know, if you go back to the '60s and what people like A. Philip Randolph and MLK were talking about with the March on Washington, which is the March March for Jobs and Justice, you're talking about dismantling American apartheid and then having a full cross racial social labor democracy. And then there's debates about how far that goes, but that's the broad parameters of what we're talking about. And so that project never happened. That happened both because of racial backlash mm -hmm. and it also happened because of the unmooring of the professional class in the Democratic Party uh, undermining, like instead of having an evolution of a global New Deal coalition, you disaggregated those things and, and you ended up moving quite to the right on economic issues. So. Even just mm -hmm. something that is built in that history uh, and expands on it is still historically unprecedented because it never happened before. But I appreciate the comment. So Thank what you. was the issue or the question? I couldn't hear the reception so well, but I think I, I think it was about what is exactly new about what we're doing. Um, and I just explained that. Like the New Deal, but not racist or sexist. You're calling from a... 787 area code. Who are you? Where are you calling from? Hi, Michael. This is uh, Daniel from Puerto Rico. Hey, Daniel. What's going on? What's on your mind? Uh, I just wanted to kind of vibe check Liman Miranda and George Clooney on their new sort of uh, Nest Cafe initiative that they've been doing marketing for. They're, okay, I don't know anything about this. What are they doing? What are those bastards doing? <laughs> Uh, they're doing a sort of, uh, we're restoring uh, Puerto Rico, we're bringing coffee to the island in a way that's really disrespectful, considering the fact that coffee's been part of uh, Puerto Rican culture for the entirety of, uh, since it's called Puerto Rico, basically. Um, what and uh, they're basically uh, working on behalf of Nestle, mm -hmm. um, their Nest Cafe brand, who is uh, who has been through the director of the Department of Agriculture, uh, been buying a lot of our fertile land, a lot of our land that's uh, great for coffee growth, um, and replacing it with their own sort of uh, trademark GMO Nestle coffee bean. So horrible. So it's not even that they are uh, bringing Puerto Rican coffee to the world, 
it's that they're bringing their uh, lower grade trademark version of coffee to Puerto Rico to then sell as Puerto Rican coffee to the world while they are taking most of the land and, you know, getting uh, water deals, water rights yep. uh, for, for a lot of, uh, a lot of our, we have, we have a lot of aquifers. Mm-hmm. A lot of mm-hmm. our mountains are aquifers and Nestle has been known to be uh, keeping an eye on everyone's water source. Yep. And yeah, well, it's the whole, I guess it's a little bit tired, but the neoliberal uh, hero uh, of Lin-Manuel Miranda coming in to sell the island out once again, I feel like I just need to like call and remind people every time he's out on the news, what's up with the guy? Not good. Yeah, bad seriously. guy. Very yeah, bad guy. I didn't guy. know all Thanks that for the stuff call, man. Him. I appreciate that, Daniel. We will keep an eye on it. I didn't... That's definitely a good bad Thanks. bad Thanks. segment for TMBS. That might be that might be bad. Very very good. Not good for you tonight. Thanks, man. I, mean, I knew that Hamilton was like sort of a hokey neoliberal cultural phenomenon. I did not know the role that Lin Manuel Miranda played in actually supporting really evil policies in Puerto Rico. And you didn't know that Hamilton was a CIA operation. Yeah, Matt, this is this has it. been something that I've been talking about for a while, but uh, it recently came up on Twitter again. Uh, Najma uh, Sharif uh, said on on Twitter, in 50 years, uh, who do you think will learn was funded by the CIA to neutralize dissent? And then uh, Eraser had asked, uh, at Sharia Prila, said, uh, Hamilton the musical, people of color rapping from the perspective of slave owners about the need for a bourgeois revolution in a British colony and the necessity to establish capital finance instrument. Absolutely the feds. And I will also say that Lynn manuel Miranda's dad works for the State Department and is a big uh, Democratic uh, Party uh, player. So... Uh, Hamilton is CIA. Sorry, folks. Oh, yeah. They're friends with the family of Ricky Rosello, the ousted, uh, ousted of governor course. of Puerto Rico. Of course. We talked about this with Molly Crabapple on our episode with her recently. All right. Time for about one more call, folks. I'm going to pick randomly. Let's see. You are calling from a 737 area code. Who are you? Where are you calling from? Oh, I'm not seeing it. Let's. You're calling from a 717 area code. Who are you? Where are you calling from? Hello, is this me? Yes. Oh, my God. Wow. Hi. Okay, crazy. Um, <laughs> I was calling because... First, can sorry, you can you tell me your thing? name and where you're calling from, please? Oh, yeah. Sorry. I'm just nervous and no didn't think I was going to get through. Um, my name is Anna. I'm from Pennsylvania. York, Pennsylvania. What's your and um, I wanted to know if you guys had any advice for me about starting a union, but like a statewide union. It feels like a really ambitious thing, but I am trying to make Papa Bernie very proud and I'm trying to do anything I can. And my mom is actually a dispatcher and they have, they get dispatchers, like a 911 dispatcher. They get um, grossly abused in their job, and they have unions, but it's only, like, county by county. So mm-hmm. it's my mom has been at her job for, like, 12 years now, and for 12 years now, I've been hearing her say, like, oh, I wish I could go to a different county or do this, but I have to wait for my pension. I have to be here another, I don't know, 10 years or however many do? years. What's your and job? I just kind of What's your job? My job? Mm-hmm. I do home health care. You do home health care. You know, yeah. to be honest with you, that's a question. I have one person that I'm talking to about doing some work with on my show about like helping people, like the ABCs of how you actually start a union. Bless you. So mm-hmm. maybe I'll run it by her, but I, I have no idea. That's a really interesting question. Does anybody else have any ideas? Yes, if you, 
Does yeah, I'm, I'm open to anything. Because also, like, just for background, I, well, you we were talking about ADHD. I have ADHD, and I mm-hmm. was, I struggled through high school. So I only have, I have my diploma, but that's it. So I'm not, like, a overly educated person. I don't even have my license in nursing or anything. I just do home health care. I hang out with people with intellectual disabilities. So that's why I'm, like, it feels really ambitious to try to start, like, a You do not need to be education thing. to do union work. <laughs> organizing that yeah. we know absolutely not uh, I, that's totally okay. not, and don't Appreciate let anybody that. use any of that to intimidate you from doing important work i hate credentialism and it's totally unnecessary absolutely anyway, does anybody have any other ideas um i would say that it's generally easier to organize under the umbrella of a pre-existing union than it is to start a whole new one because they sure. have a lot of resources that they can use to help you um so it okay. might be at least maybe somewhat fruitful to talk to organizers from different unions that you might potentially want to organize with, um, see if they're into what you're doing, because they also do kind of a cost benefit analysis of what they're going to get in return. Um, okay. But like, don't be Just got an IM that's saying that you should call the SEIU or AFSME. They might be able to provide guidance. On organizing. Okay, I just had one more question. Sure. I didn't know if um, talking to state representatives was like, would be helpful in that at all, because um, I don't know if you know who our lieutenant governor is, but he just got elected like what this year, last year or something. Uh, John Fetterman. Mm-hmm. I actually think he's, oh, yeah, he's pretty cool. progressive. Um, he for might have some, I mean, might, if you get a meeting with him. somebody like that, obviously, I mean, he might have some helpful tips for you. I mean... Yeah. Yeah, I didn't know. I don't know because I don't know much. So I didn't know if they were allowed to like get involved in stuff like that or push for things like that. Because I thought that it was the kind of thing that him and even our governor would probably be like, oh, yeah, maybe that's a thing we should have. <laughs> well, I don't think they could do it. But I mean, he could, he could certainly meet, he should be meeting with someone like you and talking with you and helping harness your energy. That's the best I could give. But call S- give SEIU or ask me a call. There's also um, people okay. in the DSA who would love to talk to you about organizing a union. The DSA has a labor branch um, in New York. I don't know if they have one in Pennsylvania, but somebody probably does know that. And um, and, and they'll they'll help yeah. you organize with an, a real eye to um, the grassroots rank and file. Yeah, democracy. I mean, and that is ultimately like it's worth talking to people, but you need to organize from the bottom up. That is how it works. So okay. we got to talk to rank and file people. Um, uh, anyways, gotcha. thank you so much for the call. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you for taking the... Oh, shit. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Anna from PA. I saw a great negative poster about Fetterman when I was visiting my mom in Pennsylvania. It mm-hmm. was like, if you're ready for a socialist Pennsylvania, vote Fetterman. And I was like, all right, great. Where do I go? Yeah, and and it, there was a picture of him looking like, I don't know, some like he was supposed to look like a like a dirty, grubby, like working class dude or whatever. And I'm like, he seems cool. <laughs> Final call of the day. You're calling from a 978 area code. Wait, sorry. I hung up on them by accident. Sorry. You're calling from a 503 area code with the final call of the day. Uh, 503, are you uh, there? Yeah. All right. Hello, this is Mitt Romney. <laughs> Final call of the day. You're calling from a 215 area code. Who are you? Where are you calling from? All right. Did you I, guys I talk about Pierre no Delecto yesterday? No, I didn't. What's that about? Mitt Romney's alias is, is a sock puppet. Oh what? Named what Pierre idiot. Delecto. Ashley Feinberg found him out. Oh, my God. He has tweets. Um, one, he liked one about... Uh, doing the 25th amendment on trump but sounds like a porn name clam uh we need the so stupid so stupid needs to be a new drop he tweeted about so uh, he also tweeted about how jennifer rubin wasn't giving him enough credit for being anti-trump <laughs> <laughs> all right final i am of the day Any update from last week on the YPG? There has been back-to-back F-16 bombings yesterday morning. We're using the now abandoned. This is an update last week from a friend in the YPG. There have been back-to-back F-16 bombings yesterday morning. 
We are now we are using the now abandoned civilian hospitals as trauma stabilization point, even though it has no power wanting water three days ago. There were Turkish drones overhead, a Turkish armed drone fired on the ambulance nearby, two dead. One instantly lost a leg, another lost his hand, the third was completely paralyzed. The next morning, Turkish artillery targeted the hospitals with high explosive rounds from their cannons sitting on the Turkish side of the border. When this didn't seem to be effective, two NATO specification F-16s flew over the border, one right after another, and dropped two large bombs on the hospital. All right, folks. We will keep covering this tomorrow. The next two days, Sam's going to be from Vegas. It's tort. See ya. It might take all the strength I got to get to where I want. But I know somehow I'm going to get there. I wasn't looking when I just got caught between the truth and the light bar. I lost my drive